Good morning, everybody. Thank you to those of you who are here, those of you who are on the committee who are online, as well as our visitors. And I'm checking here, we've got a good number of visitors again. So thank you very much for being here. Um, so this is meeting six uh, of the Decadal Survey of Ocean Sciences for the National Science Foundation. Um, I feel like this is a pivotal meeting for us. Um, we're going to hear some more new information today, but importantly, we're also going to have plenty of time for closed session discussions so that we can really start deliberating and honing in on the spirit of what our report will entail. So in that sense, this is a really important meeting. Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, let's see. Uh, Kenna already uh, spoke about the fact that the land that we're on um, uh, is really land that the Narragansett Nation, as well as, oops, um, as well as the Neantic people lived on for generations and generations. And this is a really important consideration to think about in all of our meetings, everywhere we met, um, we started out with a land acknowledgement. Um, and about, um, we, we talked about the importance of stewarding the land um, for the next generation, as well as the ocean in ways that, um, that are really sustainable. And so what does that look like to approach the work that we're doing here with that intentionality? Um, here too, of course, Rhode Island is the ocean state, right? So it's very fitting that we're meeting here and thinking about ocean science in particular, of course, with this beautiful view of the ocean right here too. So all of that is very inspiring. Um, so let's continue to think about upholding our responsibility to the land and the ocean um, as we're going about our, our days here. Let's do the things we're doing for the right reasons, right? We were just talking about that. Let, let's make sure that we keep we keep that right reason front and center. Uh, we're not sharing the right screen. Are share it? Oh, we're not sharing the right screen. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Because it looks like on my end that I'm sharing my screen. Right. Huh. So let me try again. So I stopped sharing the screen and I share screen. PowerPoint. This one. There you go. Oh, yeah. You see there? Yeah. Yeah. So there is the land acknowledgement. Um, okay. Uh, expectations of conduct. We go through this at the beginning of all of our meetings. Um, really, we want to make sure that all of the voices are heard and that we listen respectfully. Um, and we look to uh, everybody's commitment to upholding these standards that the National Academy has set. Um, and this includes, of course, the committee itself, but also anybody who's participating uh, during the open session times. Um, no form of discrimination, harassment, bullying will be um, condoned. And so let's make sure that we um, hold each other to, to these standards. Just give me another minute to have a quick one. Okay, so more detail about our particular um, committee. So this is a decadal survey. We're really looking to uh, set a research agenda for the next 10 years for the ocean sciences. We have 24 months to do this work. Um, much of the beginning months were dedicated to our interim report. Many of you will remember that um, NSF asked us for an interim report on ocean drilling with some very specific questions that they asked us, and we tried to stay very true to our statement of task in that case, and so will we try to do so in this case, in the case of the full report. Of course, our sponsor is the National Science Foundation, but we are thinking about the ocean sciences enterprise broadly. And we have representation here from folks who are familiar with other agencies other than NSF, so that's great. We have 23 experts on the committee. Um, so it's a relatively large committee. It's a very diverse committee, both in terms of geographically speaking, um, people who are kneeling from all um, parts of the, the country, but also in other ways, in terms of you know uh, career stage and in terms of lived experience, we have a pretty diverse committee that's come together. Um, so we've already had five meetings. They've all been hybrid. 
um, two day meetings. We have monthly virtual meetings. We have subgroups that get together. This this group has really been willing to do a lot of hard work. Um, many of our meetings are open and open to the public. And um, I have seen even in our monthly meetings, lots of participation, so that's great. Um, but then of course we do have some closed meetings for deliberations. And as per National Academy policy, those deliberations will remain locked up forever, right? It's only the report that will be coming out at the end of all of that. Um, and the, you know, the push and pull, the pro and con, all those conversations that we're having during closed meetings, um, that will remain closed. The, our interim report was released to the public in March 2024. We had a number of briefings regarding it and some feedback. Um, uh, and then we were able to leave that work behind. So, of course, bring the conclusions into this next set of deliberations. Our final report is scheduled to be released in early 2025. We hope to have a draft out to review before the end of the calendar year. Okay, here's our statement of task. Um, and boy, we poured over the statement of task so much already. I feel like I know every word by heart. Um, but essentially, the first item on our statement of task relates to youth inspired solutions oriented research and innovation. So, this really follows very closely to the comments that Ken already made earlier this morning before the open session started. Um, our second item in our statement of task deals with innovative, multidisciplinary, multi-sectoral approaches and really speaks to complex science challenges arising from that intersection between natural processes, societal needs, um, and the human-driven and environmental change. Um, so this is the piece where we really get to talk about the complex problems that really rely on system-wide thinking. The third item on our statement of task talks about um, developing a priority of high, a portfolio of high priority scientific questions um, that have the potential to transform scientific knowledge of the ocean and its critical role. So this is really where we get to talk about the fundamental basic science questions, right? NSF funds basic science all around, but that basic science can be use inspired. So that's statement of task number one. It can be complex and requires systems level thinking, that's statement of task two. Um, or it can just be basic fundamental basic questions and that's really the statement of task number three. Um, the fourth item in our statement of task talks about research infrastructure needed to advance these high priority questions. Um, so once we have nailed down one, two, three, then four will reveal itself, I think. And then statement of task item number five is developing a framework that OCE can use um, to leverage, complement the capabilities, expertise of its partners. And this can be uh, industry partners, other government partners. So this is a really important consideration to think about. Now, um, these are not all of the words that are contained within our statement of task. Um, Certainly here uh, within the statement of task, and I believe it's within statement of task number two, there is explicit mention of workforce development. Um, so that's something that we need to take into account as well. All right, here are the committee members. Um, myself here at uh, Tuba, Askin Haller, OSU, I serve as co-chair along with um, my dear colleague, Jim Yoder, who's associated with Woods Hole, as well as our host institution, University of Rhode Island, also co-chair. Um, I won't take the time to have everybody introduce themselves this morning, but you see, um, again, a large committee uh, hailing from both educational institutions, uh, foundations, um, government institutions, so really a wide variety of expertise that we have present here today. Um, okay, so public uh, agenda for day one. Um, this morning, we're going to start with talking about research priorities in marine geology and geophysics. I'm very much looking forward to this session. Short break, um, and then we will continue our um, ocean life series, this time with a part two. Um, and then the public session will adjourn at 1230 p.m. local time here, Eastern time. Tomorrow, we also have a short uh, public session uh, where we will talk about urban seas and coastal ocean <laughs> priorities um, during the public session at one. So we'll have 
lots of time in the afternoons for closed deliberations. All right, and so with that, I think I want to hand it over to Maya, who will be um, who will be uh, uh, facilitating the first session of learning geology and geophysics. Okay, thank you very much, Tobias. So I am also really excited about the session this morning. We're talking about marine geology and geophysics, and I think it's a it's an area that often gets uh, left to the bottom of the list since it's on the bottom of the ocean, mm -hmm. and but it's really the important plate tectonic engine that drives so much of what happens on our planet, both in our ocean system and our atmospheric system. Um, it really touches on all four, all five of our, sorry, so think of the tasks, and um, it certainly has a lot of use inspired and solutions-based work, but also um, is a really fun, a lot of fundamental basic science questions, and certainly is a complex uh, a system. And so, we're, we have four speakers today, one of which is uh, currently in transit by normal plane or train, and so has pre-recorded her, um, her talk. But we're going to have about 10 minutes for each talk, and then 40 minutes for conversation afterwards. Until 10.45, I think. Okay. So I think, are we going to hold questions until the end? Sorry. Okay. Well, Maybe we'll have one or two questions after the talk and then and then but save most of the discussion uh, till the end. So we're gonna start uh, just we're gonna go through the order that it is in the program. So I'm going to invite Russ Cornell Turner from Scripps Institution of Ethnography to please uh, share your slides and start the talk. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello everyone. Can can you see my slides and hear me okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Okay, uh, so thank, thank you for the opportunity to come and um, talk to you today. I'm Ross Parnell-Turner. I'm at Scripps Oceanography. Um, and uh, my plan this morning in my, in my 10 minutes is to tell you about three of the biggest questions I think we, uh, we face in marine geology and geophysics. And those are, um, the first one relates to how heat, fluids, and matter are exchanged between the ocean and the crust. The second one is about how the ocean floor is shaped, and I'll explain a bit more about what I mean by that um, in a moment. And then thirdly, what role do um, does the incoming oceanic plate play in subduction zones? Um, and then uh, at the end, I'm just going to briefly uh, share some thoughts on marine geophysical facilities um, in the US. So to begin with, um, we it's really important that we understand how fluids, heat, and matter are exchanged between the ocean and the crust. And we really don't understand fully how these fluids are transported in terms of the pathways that they take. So the scale and the depth of fluid circulation systems like this one, this hydrothermal dense system on the East Pacific rise. We don't know where fluids are recharged from and we don't know how long those molecules spend in the subsurface. And we, we know, for example, that spreading rate and magma supply have an impact on these fluid exchange systems. But in particular, at slow spreading ridges in places like the Atlantic and the Indian Oceans, we really don't understand how these systems operate properly. And this is societally important for a couple of reasons, um, one of which is that we find the building blocks of life on mid-ocean ridge hyd hydrothermal vent systems, and not only on, on mid-ocean ridges, but also on older off-axis crust. And it's this off-axis area that has really been overlooked um, for several decades. And then finally, it's important to understand these delicate ecosystems because we're kind of in, going into a into a, a period when uh, seafloor mining is becoming more likely, and agencies and government bodies are starting to have to make important stewardship decisions about how these resources um, are managed. So the tools that we need to make progress here are things like the ability to take in situ samples with submersibles like Alvin and Jason in the National Facility. I'll talk a bit more the, about those in a moment. We need to be able to have the ability to collect data autonomously using um, robots that can operate over large areas of the seafloor. And we need to be able to collect samples using some form of ocean drilling, although I'm not going to dwell too much on that. So this is a map you've probably seen before of the global distribution of seafloor vents. So you'll notice that we have these little red dots located on the mid-ocean ridges, which are the black lines. And you'll see there's quite a few places where there are gaps. And that's likely not because there aren't any vents there, it's just because we haven't had the ability to look. So there's a large amount of the ocean where we haven't properly characterized the um, hydrothermal circulation systems on the ridge axis. You'll also notice these orange, you know, these yellow dots where we have um, licensed seafloor massive sulfide um, exploration areas. 
um, over here on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and over here on the Southeast Indian Ridge, covering large areas where we know we have these active hydrothermal vent systems which support ecosystems. I said that we have action happening off axis as well. This is a cartoon that was drawn a few years ago now and appears in the final report for um, Ross Coggins' um, uh, IODP expedition um, that was published this year. So we know that we have fluid circulation on the ridge axis over here on the left-hand side of this diagram, but it's also very likely that there's exchange going on on a crust that's much older. So this lower axis shows you on crust up to maybe 60 to 120 million years old, we still have this exchange between the oceans the sediment and the crust. And we really don't know how deep these hydrothermal fluids penetrate or what they control in terms of the limits of life um, down into maybe even the base of the lowermost crust. So the second question I'd like to discuss with you is what controls the shape of the ocean floor? And this is important because the oceans constitute a large portion of our planet and volcanism on mid-ocean ridges repaves that ocean floor. And it's important to understand from a first order primary um, uh, characteristic of our planet, but also has implications for things like uh, seafloor roughness, which in turn plays a major role in things like ocean circulation and mixing. And we can also use what we learn about volcanic systems on mid-ocean bridges to understand volcanic systems on land. And in particular in the oceans, volcanic systems are relatively accessible and they're relatively simple, and we can use them to make uh, informed decisions about volcanic hazard assessment um, in places where humans live. Part of the problem is that we've only mapped about 30% of the seafloor. Some of you may have known about um, the Seabed 2030 project. And also we don't understand a lot about how melt, how magma is stored and transported within the crust. And we don't really know enough about how the composition of that melt might vary and determine how oceanic volcanism takes place. And we don't know how, um, for example, glacial cycles might impact the pace of volcanism. The tools that we might need to tackle this are things like long-term observations, so using observatories, measuring things like seismicity, so earthquakes that happen on mid-ocean ridges are very helpful, detailed mapping and seismic imaging, and measuring things like fluid temperature and geochemistry. I'm gonna show you some examples of seismic imaging in a moment. So these are the results from a paper published um, by Milena Marjanovic um, just earlier last year. We're here on the East Pacific Rise, which is a very well-studied segment of the um, Mid-Ocean Ridge spreading system. And here for the first time, we've got uh, uh, high resolution 3D images of magma bodies. These are um, shown here on this panel on the lower, lower right. You can see these kind of bright reflection reflections. These are magma lenses that are about one and a half kilometers below the seafloor. And we can see them in 3D. I'll show you in a moment how these things look in three dimensions. This experiment was conducted in 2008, so quite a long time ago now, and is one of only two such experiments where we can image these magma bodies in the subsurface. So we're really hampered by the, the amount of observations that we have on these kinds of systems. And this is what those magma bodies look like in 3D. Um, they're uh, lenses that are oriented parallel to the ridge axis here, and we can see that they have this stacked kind of um, uh, geometry to them. And it's only with these 3D images that we can understand how these magma lenses um, uh, uh, behave uh, in the subsurface. So the, last, the third and last question I wanna to talk to you about is how the history of an oceanic plate impacts subduction zones where the lithospheric plate goes back in, into the mantle. And we know from modeling studies like this one from 2014 that fluids play a really critical role in controlling how earthquakes, earthquakes take place on the plate interface. But the presence and dis distribution of those fluids is really difficult to quantify. And we know that the plate arrives at the subduction zone having had this kind of variable history of volcanism, hydrothermal alteration, and stress. So that you can imagine the plate shows up at the subduction zone with all this kind of um, beaten up history of, of the past. And so we need to know about the structure and the fluid content of the plate to understand how the subduction zone behaves. And the tools we need to understand this are things like electromagnetism. I'm going to show you some examples in a moment. Reflection and refraction seismic imaging and things like full waveform um, inversion. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you an example of a nice study from the Hikurangi margin off the coast of um, New Zealand, where we see the impact of subducting seamounts on the ability to deliver water into the mantle. So here we are off the uh, east coast of New Zealand. I'm gonna show you in the next slide a profile along this black line, which I'm pointing out right here. These are results from a paper by uh, Christine Chesley and others uh, that was published a couple of years ago. 
So this was a combi combined marine electromagnetism and seismicity and um, active source seismology experiment. This profile shows the incoming subducting plate. The plate interface is shown by this black line right here. And what we're looking at here is a resistivity image. So the warm colors are low resistivity and the, the blue colors are a high resistivity. And this shows us something about the fluid content of the subsurface here. And these, these three red blobs you can see where my mouse is are thought to be patches of enhanced uh, fluid content as a result of this downgoing dome-shaped feature you see here, which is thought to be a downgoing um, seamount. And these little dots and stars you see here are seismicity that are associated with that seamount feature. In the next slide, I'm going to show you a seismic reflection image just on this uh, kind of white box here. And because we have this co-located electromagnetic profile, the seismic reflection profile, which I'm showing here, which shows you this detailed structure of the downgoing plate, we can understand how the seismicity that we, I show you, showed you previously, so those, those repeating earthquakes are associated with um, this downgoing um, seamount, which has this fracture network that encourages the presence um, of fluids in the subsurface. So by doing this kind of integrated multidisciplinary study, we can understand the effects of fluids and things like downgoing seamounts in subduction zones, which helps us to assess things like hazard. So in the last couple of minutes, I just wanted to touch on the current state of US marine geophysical facilities. So these are the tools that we use to tackle these problems. And I'm just gonna highlight a couple of them that I feel are particularly um, sensitive and important. And the first one is the ocean bottom seismograph pool. Um, this is an instrument pool that's, um, that is used for collecting um, high resolution images on, uh, and monitoring um, seismicity in the oceans. These instruments are mostly operated by Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. This is an image on the right hand side showing one of their short period instruments. These short period instruments are over 20 years old um, and they're rather complex and large to handle and it's becoming more and more difficult to conduct the kind of science that we need to be able to do. And because they're old, they're becoming unreliable. They use technology that's outdated. And you can think about the cost per datum or the cost per byte is very high for these instruments now because we need more and more um, maintenance to keep them operating. So if we wanna continue doing these kinds of groundbreaking scientific experiments, we really need to, really, really need to invest in a larger pool of instruments of up-to-date um, ocean bottom seismographs. The second instrument pool I wanted to mention is the Marine Electromagnetics Instrument Pool. So there is no central NSF sponsored facility for electromagnetics. So the community relies upon um, the group here at Scripps to maintain uh, their own pool. And yet, as I showed you in the previous slide, these marine electromagnetics tools are critical to understand subsurface fluids, which in turn are critical to understand things like subduction zones. And again, this instrument design is over 20 years old. The electronics in these instruments hasn't changed for two decades and they're becoming, um, uh, they, they uh, are in bad need of, a, of an update. And then lastly, I wanted to talk about active source seismology. So those seismic reflection images of those magma bodies and also the images of that subduction zone were collected using um, this vessel, the Marcus Langseth, which I'm sure most of you know. It was built back in 1991, so uh, 33 years ago now, and was refitted uh, in 2007. It's no longer an NSF facility, so um, that means it has an uncertain future. And this uncertainty I wanted to, wanted to emphasize really suppresses the ability of, of scientists to enter the field and also conduct their science, because there's uncertainty about whether this facility is gonna be available to us in the future. And in particular for early career scientists, this really uh, is a barrier to entry because it's un uncertain if this um, is gonna be available in the future. The equipment on board the Langseth is, is great, but it's certainly aging. So for example, the acoustic sources require more and more maintenance. And yet the long streamer capability, the tune source and the 3D imaging capability are essential for making progress in these questions I've showed you before. And then lastly, I wanted to mention the deep submergence facility, which again is at Hui. There's very high demand for their vehicles, such as Alvin, Jason, and Sentry, but there's a very limited amount of time, obviously, that, that, that each one of these vehicles is available. And this really drives the pace at which we can do um, science on the seafloor. And also I wanted to mention that um, given that we have the retirement of the Joides resolution, our sampling options, so the way that we can collect samples on the seafloor is even more limited than it was before without that ability to go and collect them using, um, using the drill ship. So thank you for your attention and I'll, um, I'll leave it there. All right, thank you very much, Russ. Um, I think what we'll do is just one or two questions from the committee only, and then at, at the end, we'll have a broader uh, discussion where we will eventually open it up to those online as well. 
Are there any quick questions from the committee? Yes, Jim. Well, yes, Russ. Um, uh, the three D seismic imaging. My my one rumor I heard is that there is some consideration of a, of a new seismic ship, but it would only have two D capability, uh, which is I guess would be less expensive to operate. Is that? Um, you, what's your response to that, or what's your opinion? So um, the 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 3D capability um, of the Langset is unique, um, and it it is the only way that we can collect uh, 3D images of the subsurface. So um, I think that 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 capability is is really important for the for the US community. And the other thing that the Langset uh, has the capability to do is to tow a very long streamer, so a, a 12 or a 16 kilometer long streamer, and it's that long streamer that gives us the wide angle. Um, uh, Wide angle uh, energy reflections that we can um, we can measure that gives us uh, the ability to image deeper into the into the Earth's crust and upper mantle. So it's really the combination of the three D and a long streamer um, that we really need um, as a community. Thank you. Okay. Any other quick questions? All right, thank you. Then let's move on to uh, Jessica Warren from the University of Delaware, and and Jessica has pre recorded. Her talk, as I mentioned. <clears throat> so, Terry, this is not a directness. Yes. Uh, what's the SMS situation? SMS. Do you know that the is the The SMS on the map slide. What was the slide? Russ, do you have mining? I think the M is mining, so I'm on the board. Uh, the SMS is seafloor massive sulfides. Well, I interpret it though as he was pointing it out as massive sulfide for yes. a particular reason. Right. It was like certified massive sulfide. Yeah, maybe we can get to that. Is that showing up on your screen? Yeah, okay. Let me know if you can't hear this on Zoom. Hopefully you can. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to speak to this panel. I'm excited to talk about research priorities in marine geology and geophysics. What I'm going to focus on today is this question that we've uh, been looking at for a while with a group of collaborators, which is what drives the recurrence of large earthquakes? Um, and specifically how we can use oceanic transform faults to explore this question. And this is really a multidisciplinary topic uh, that um, benefits from a whole variety of oceanographic um, instrumentation to study this. Um, and also I should say that we focus on the oceanic lithosphere and faults um, in the oceans because of the simplicity of the rock types that we're looking at compared to looking at faults in the continents. But ultimately in looking at the recurrence of large earthquakes in the oceans, we wanna understand overall what's happening with earthquakes globally. So ocean uh, ridge transform faults, uh, if you're not uh, um, always looking at the plate tectonic map, this is a map of the earth uh, with the thin uh, line uh, showing the plate boundaries here, uh, the mid-ocean ridge spreading system, and then these thicker black lines are the transform faults that offset the ridges at many places. Um, cumulatively, that corresponds to around 16,000 kilometers of faults. Um, but for the purposes of, lo of looking at seismicity, what is really useful about them is some of the um, repeatability um, that occurs with some of these earthquakes that have allowed us to look at the seismic cycle at timescales that aren't really practical on continents. So I've just highlighted here the GOFAR area. This is on the East Pacific rise. This is the fastest spreading ridge on Earth. And as a consequence, these are very fast slipping faults that offset the ridge. Uh, this is a zoom in now of the bathymetric map collected with shipboard 
data, um, and this is showing it's actually there's a set of three folds in very close succession. So this is typical middle uh, East Pacific rise uh, Mid Ocean Ridge threading center here, and then it goes into this very large um, transform fault, the Gofar transform fault that has three segments with two offsets. Um, there's another bit of regular ridge here, and then the Discovery transform fault, another bit of ridge, and then the Cabrada transform fault. Um, these are slipping at a rate of about 12 centimeters per year. For context, that is around four times faster than the San Andreas Fault. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to focus on the GOFAR transfer fault. And a lot of what I show you is going to be on this G3 segment, the westernmost portion, westernmost portion of it, which is um, among, I would say, probably the most studied oceanic transfer fault for seismicity. So why are we so interested in looking at this fault? Well, there's a, a couple of aspects of the behavior that are very interesting. I'm going to highlight some of them in this talk. Uh, so one of them is these uh, repeating earthquakes that occur every five to six years. So this is, again, our map of um, the Gofar Fault and then also Discovery Fault up here. The colored dots are earthquakes that are greater than magnitude five that can be detected by the Global Seismic Network. These are seismometers located on land. They can't detect all the small earthquakes that always happen on faults, but they can detect these large events that are accommodating the slip on these segments of the fault. And you can see here that the red dots, this is the same patch of fault rupturing approximately every five to six years. There's a yellow patch here, which is actually bifurcated in the past 10 years. That uh, middle segment also has this repeating stuff. Um, and so all of these segments have these repeating earthquakes. We now have a really nice catalog going back to 1990 when the um, network really came online. Um, the uh, black squares here and here are a um, ocean bottom seismometer deployment that was conducted in 2007 to 2008. And then the red box here is highlighting the more recent work we, which we did from 2019 to 2022 with two years of OBS deployments that we moved around um, on the GOFAR transform fault um, with a focus of looking at the seismic cycle. So key observations are that there are repeating earthquakes on the seismically active sections of these faults. But in addition, there are sections of these faults that never have large earthquakes, and they cannot be accommodating slip by earthquakes, at least not in the modern record. They must be undergoing some form of creep that does not give rise to catastrophic failure leading to earthquakes. Um, and that occurs on all of these segments of the fault. Um, but another aspect of these repeating earthquakes is that they are some of the most predictable earthquakes on Earth. Because the fault is slipping so fast, the repeat time is very, very short, which means that we can um, instrument the seismic cycle um, with a high probability of um, capturing an earthquake. Um, and this is indeed what we were able to do. Um, so in 2018, Margaret Betker led a group of us in writing a proposal. The goal was to look at the end of the seismic cycle and to have ocean bottom seismometers deployed around the fault. Um, and in the, in the proposal itself, she said, our proposed deployment of OBSs will cover a significant portion of the expected probability distribution function of each upcoming earthquake, with the goal that if we deployed, we had a high likelihood of catching one of these major um, magnitude six earthquakes during the one year to two years that we could have seismometers out on the seafloor. We deployed the seismometers in 2019, and in March 2020, one of the good pieces of news that we got was that there was indeed a large event right in the middle where we had deployed instruments on the G1 segment of GOFAR. So that was really nice news. Um, we, in total, collected a lot of data on that project. I'm showing one snapshot of the data, chat, data set that we got from the ocean bottom seismometers. Um, this is work that Jinwa Gong is leading at University of Indiana. Um, the triangles here shows the seismometers that were deployed. Um, and then the, um, all of these little white dots here. Sorry, this is, this is the fault, the G1 segment of the fault. And then this is East Pacific Rise. This is the little intertransform offset. All of these dots are the seismicity, seismicity that was detected by the OBS array. Um, and so this is way more than we can detect from land, right? This is why we need the seismometers on the seafloor. And in addition, there's a huge amount of things going on in the fold itself that we're still um, working to understand. So we, this is that main shock event uh, that happened in March 2020. You can see that there's this section of the fold um, that's very active leading up to it. It then shuts off. In contrast, these other two portions are relatively quiet, particularly this one prior to the main shot event, and then they have a lot of aftershocks associated with them. So there's um, behavior in these faults uh, linked to these main shot events that we are still working to understand what is driving the clustering of events, what is driving the shift in behavior along different segments. In addition, for example, this section um, that has a lot of seismicity leading up to the main shock event and then shuts off, that's actually one of these portions that never see large events that must be entirely accommodating slip by some peak mechanism. So there's a lot that um, we are still learning from looking at the seismic data. 
But one of the goals with this project was not just to collect OBS data, but to use a variety of other tools to explore the sequel. So we were fortunate to also have um, Sentry aboard the last cruise to do some mapping um, of the seafloor. In the first cruise, we had rock dredging. And then in addition, Rob Evans uh, led um, an add-on project that did an electromagnetic survey of the seafloor. And overall, we wanted to understand the earthquake cycle on these faults to investigate why the barrier zones limit large earthquakes and also to understand the role of fluid flow for the fault structure. We um, think that fluid flow in these faults is very important in um, controlling the seismicity, but pinning that down is really challenging. It's an ongoing effort. Um, to understand. One of the things we did for the first time with this fault was to actually sample the fault itself. Um, there's been very few faults uh, globally on the seafloor that have had any sampling of the fault zone. For the GOFAR um, fault system, there had been a lot of work on the seismicity, and yet no samples have been recovered from the fault zone. So we conducted a set of 10 dredges on the G3 segment uh, during the 2019 cruise. We targeted this very small ridge you can see here, here, here. That um, from the shipboard bathymetry was our estimate of where the fault was outcropping on the seafloor. Um, just to zoom in a little bit on that, and sorry, I should say we also collected a bunch of wretches. These are basalts that are being crushed up in the fault zone. They represent the products of intense deformation in a brittle field. Um, and they also have are extensively hydrated, so they are telling us a lot about the changes that happen in the fault. But another aspect I want to highlight is that from the shipboard bathymetry, this was what we could estimate was the fault itself. Um, Fortunately, two years later, we were able to go back in with Sentry and run these very high resolution near bottom surveys um, using Sentry to map the seafloor with multi-beam. And we have incredible detail in these maps now. So this is the fault zone. This is that little ridge that I was showing in the previous slide. When you zoom in even further in the high resolution maps, um, you can see that the fault is outcropping on the seafloor. We have photos from Sentry showing fault stops. You can see a zone of disrupted seafloor before going to smooth seafloor. You can also see our dredge tracks um, that are plotted on top here, and that if we had had the judge, the century data before our judging, we would of course um, run the judges differently and run from the south um, up this ridge because this is really where the true fault zone outcrop is. But with the, sea, the shipboard bathymetry, um, we did the best that we could at the time. Um, but again, this is one of the key reasons why actually using century ahead of judging is um, to be a very useful tool. Um, and then another component of this project was looking at, electro, at electrical resistivity. These are results from Christine Chesley. They're very striking results. So there were three transects run across the, um, the G3 segment of GOFAR. This is um, here she's highlighting the results from one of those profiles. Um, and this is showing that they're very high conductivity, low resistivity anomalies at depth in the fault, as well as at shallower sections of the fault. Um, the amount of this um, anomaly suggests that there's a role of brines in the fault system. Um, this is still an ongoing uh, project to understand what is driving the generation of such a deep, high um, conductivity anomaly. Um, this is not something that we expected going in. This is also something where, um, you know, this is uh, the only profiles we have of a transfer fault. And so interpreting them in the absence of knowing what other faults look like is challenging because we don't know if this is an unusual result that we happen to pick a very um, odd system or if there's something very typical of the transfer faults overall. So to go back to this question of what drives the recurrence of large earthquakes, we think that fluid flow is very important in these systems. We see hints of it in the samples that we collect, in the EM data. Um, there's also seismic refraction data that indicates high porosity, also suggesting fluid flow. But we're still working to be able to really link that fluid flow that we think is happening to what is driving sections of the fault to have large, um, large earthquakes versus sections of the faults that never have large earthquakes and must un be undergoing creep. Uh, things that we need um, to um, develop our understanding of the seismicity is to sample the actual rupturing part of the fault. Um, the dredging gets us some deformed samples, but it doesn't quite get us to the true seismogenic zone on the fault as best we can estimate. Um, we need ROV or HOV transects of the fault to look at fault outcrops to be able to sample the outcrops themselves. Um, we need to look at additional faults, particularly ones that are slipping at rates closer to continental faults, um, to look at what that can tell us about controls on um, slip behavior on faults. And I should also say that we uh, need seafloor geodesy to look at the creeping on these faults. We know from on land faults and from subduction zone systems that's a, that there's a lot of slow slip and creep in these fault systems. But until we have geodesy, we're really struggling to capture that in detail on these um, oceanic transfer faults. So I'm just going to take a couple extra minutes because I was told I could take a little bit of extra time, um, fortunately, because I'm not able to attend this session live. And I want to highlight some other aspects of this. Um, so this is um, the fact that uh, we were able to do a lot of workforce training in multidisciplinary science. Um, the GoFar project involved 
the GoFile project involved um, about 20 undergraduates, grad students, and postdocs, in addition to scientists and um, uh, professors that were on the ship. Uh, we had about, um, I think, six or seven institutions involved in the end. Um, and some of the early career scientists that were involved in this project have gone into careers in academia, industry, and government. Um, so it's been really uh, pleasant to watch uh, the progression of participants in this project. Um, we also uh, published an article last year that Margaret Betcher led in EOS, um, talking about both the challenges of conducting fieldwork during COVID, but also ways in which we adapted our model for both shore-based and seagoing science, and the way that we were able to bring additional participants into the project uh, through doing that. Um, so this, uh, these types of projects inherently expose um, all the participants to multiple fields of science and give them a lot of training in um, these big field campaigns. Um, and then uh, thinking ahead, um, what are the research infrastructure needs? So one of the big challenges we have at the moment is with dredging. Um, you know, we have lost the capability that we had 30 years ago. Some of this is because we have much better safety on the ships, um, but that has meant that we no longer have systems that can handle the large tensions that we need to reach for effective dredging. This um, going forward means that we really need to replace the steel wires that are very heavy with synthetic lines. Um, we also need to upgrade A-frames and winches so that they can handle these high um, tensions um, and can do some of this heavier work that we need done. These types of upgrades that would benefit dredging would also benefit pouring uh, systems as well as mooring deployments that are using heavy systems. Um, so I think this is, is uh, something that would benefit the ships overall. Um, and there's also going to be increased demand for things like dredging and pouring as IODP goes offline and we need to use other techniques to sample the seafloor. Um, and then uh, in terms of facilities, I just want to highlight that this project really benefited from a lot of facilities. Uh, deep submergence is really state of the art. The tools we have access to is, is absolutely amazing. I think the main challenge there is their limited availability. Um, and in some sense, upgrading <coughs> other equipment would take some, but of course not all the pressure off of using um, HOVs, ROVs, and AUVs. Um, ocean bottom seismometers, also high demand, amazing data that we get out of this. This is also an aging instrument pool for which there's a lot of concern about the long-term plans um, and access to this equipment. Um, the marine electromagnetism, this was a great add-on to the experiment. Um, there's definitely a need for facility and wider access to this equipment. And then seafloor geodesy is really in a nascent stage in the U.S. Um, more de development is needed, but there's a lot of um, important science questions that can be answered uh, by developing this as well. From our perspective for faults, for looking at creep and slow slip on these systems will be really key. Um, and then the final thing that I want to say is just the ship infrastructure. Um, this project needed global cost vessels. There's a huge demand for these ships. There's a need for increased capabilities. As I said, there's some refits such as synthetic wires would, which would improve aspects of these ships, but there's also a need for long-term planning so that the U.S. can remain a global leader in marine research. So with that, I'm just going to leave some of our main priorities up on the screen to finish, and I'd like to acknowledge as well that um, this project benefited from a collaboration with a whole bunch of people as well as discussions about facilities with the people listed on this slide. Um, it's really been a pleasure to work with this group. So thank you very much. I'm sorry that I'm not available to answer questions uh, in person, but I would of course be happy to answer questions by email. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Well, thank you to, to Jessica and sorry she couldn't be with us. We will move straight on to uh, Frieder Klein from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Share your slides. Really yeah, good morning. Um, hi, um, my name is Frieder Klein. I'm a petrologist, geochemist at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and um, I study fluid rock interactions in oceanic settings. And uh, that uh, is something I want to talk about today. Um, and can you see my slides okay? We can see the we can see both the slides and the upcoming slides. Do you want to put it in presenter mode? Oh, hang on. Um, is that better? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Okay, so um, I'm gonna start out with these uh, three iconic hydrothermal systems: the um, Lost City hydrothermal system that is hosted in. Um, um, hydrothermally altered uh, mantle rocks, serpentinites. Uh, then we have the tag hydrothermal field that is hosted in uh, mafic rocks or basalt. And then we have the uh, Lagerchev hydrothermal field that is hosted in both um, altered uh, mafic uh, rocks and ultramafic rocks. 
And when we look at the fluid composition of the vent fluids that are emanating from these structures, we can see some significant differences. So for example, the pH of the Lost City hydrothermal field is uh, uh, significantly higher than that of the Rainbow, uh, the, the Logachev and Tag hydrothermal fields. Whereas like the silica concentration is higher um, at TAG, um, we have differences in the methane concentrations and, and hydrogen concentrations that are both higher in these um, systems um, influenced by alteration of mantle rocks. And so the alteration of mantle rocks, I just want to give you a brief primer to set the stage here. Uh, this is a process that uh, we refer to as a pentonization that turns a, a mechanically strong a dry and weakly oxidized and dense rock um, into a rock that contains um, uh, more than 12 weight percent water. So that's about 325 kilograms per cubic meter. It's less dense and um, mechanically weak, uh, strongly oxidized. And, and that process, because it takes on water and turns hydrous, anhydrous minerals like olivine and pyroxene into hydrous minerals like serpentine group minerals and brucite and so on. Um, that uh, causes a volume increase of about 40%. And so uh, some of these uh, uh, changes that we're observing are more or less linear, whereas others are highly nonlinear, like the, um, the shear strength of the, the altered rock uh, dramatically decreases with a, um, a slight uh, increase in the extent of serpentinization. And along the way, we form um, hydrogen and methane um, as, as iron is being oxidized uh, by water. And uh, these volatiles play important roles in the sustenance of microbial life uh, below the seafloor. Now, when we look at this map here, you can see that there's a um, very, uh, uh, there are big differences in the full spreading rates when you look at the Atlantic, um, Arctic, and Indian oceans uh, when compared to, to the um, the Pacific Ocean where spreading rates are much faster. So in the Pacific, we have layered uh, oceanic crust um, at into, that forms at intermediate to super fast spreading ridges. So we have uh, uh, the, the typical layer cake structure. Uh, the, diff the thickness of these individual layers uh, vary somewhat, um, but overall we have a more or less homogeneous uh, structure. In contrast, um, slow and ultra slow spreading ridges create oceanic plates that are much more heterogeneous. And uh, shown here is a, um, a cartoon from uh, Jeff Carson's um, uh, book, Discovering the Deep, which I highly recommend. Um, so showing the, the great diversity of the abundance of um, um, mantle rocks and crustal rocks that are formed in settings that are experience much more variable uh, magma supply and faulting that causes then the, the formation of oceanic uh, core complexes and detachment faults. Um, so the question, one of the key questions that I think uh, is important um, to address in the next decade or so is, is what are the proportions of mafic and ultramafic rocks in rich uh, flank and off-axis environments in the Atlantic, Arctic, and Indian Oceans? So much of the work that has been done thus far uh, is uh, limited to uh, the oceanic ridges themselves, but we know very little about the uh, ridge flanks and off-axis environments. Uh, Russ was um, talking a little bit about that uh, earlier. So, and then uh, related to that, how deep does um, the aqueous alteration below, extend below the seafloor? And we have, um, a few constraints from seismic studies um, along the global mid-ocean ridge system. And you can see that there is a, a increase in the depth below the seafloor where at which um, earthquakes occur, which defines kind of like the, the, the brittle ductile transition zone um, and the possible extent of hydrothermal alteration. So that increases with um, the depth increases with decreasing uh, full spreading rates. Now, how that changes off axis, uh, we do not really know. And that's a big question. Like, is there, uh, how far off axis does um, hydrothermal alteration extend? And, um, but also then how far off axis and how deep does uh, weathering, uh, so low temperature alteration of these rocks extend? 
And when we look at um, weathering of altered basalt, um, here is a compilation by uh, Staudigel et al. 2013. We see that there's quite a bit of water in, um, in altered basalt, as well as CO2, although that seems to be more limited to the upper parts of the um, extrusive, extrusive sections. Now, on the right here are um, uh, CAT scan uh, images of um, weathered um, hydrothermally altered mantle rocks, so whether it's a pentonite, and these very dark patches indicate porosity. So that porosity is an indication of dissolution of minerals, and dissolution of minerals in seafloor environments generates alkalinity, and alkalinity is very important uh, for the, the, the balance of, uh, of uh, seawater chemistry and how it, um, uh, uh, and its ability to absorb CO2 from the atmosphere. Now, when we look at alkalinity um, uh, estimates and like how alkalinity is controlled in seawater, we look at um, big scale processes like river inputs. We look at submarine groundwater discharge. Um, more recent um, studies look at anaerobic processes, organic matter uh, burial we have long known about reverse weathering, but there's very little, uh, surprisingly little work on uh, weathering of mafic and ultramafic rocks in off-axis environments, particularly ultramafic rocks we do know next to nothing about, even though they are very potent um, in uh, contributing alkalinity during dissolution of, for example, olivine or brucite. And then related to that, because we have um, the dissolution of these magnesium um, bearing rocks during or minerals during weathering, that can have an impact on uh, the magnesium calcium ratio of seawater. And we know that there are uh, significant changes of magnesium calcium ratios of seawater uh, during the Phanerozoic, but we have no idea what their relative contributions are from weathering of um, um, oceanic uh, rocks from the crust and mantle. And then, um, there, there's a lot of research on the uh, implications of subducting oceanic plates and how that affects arc volcanism. But like one of the, if you recall that most of the um, uh, volcanic arcs are set in the Pacific and serpentinites are believed to play a significant role in the delivery of water and um, other uh, volatiles into subduction zones, but we have no idea of how much serpentinite there is or possibly altered gabbro. Uh, there's pretty much no, um, no uh, really robust constraints on that. And here too, we don't really know what the depth of aqueous alteration is and how um, that may change off axis. And there are like a lot of Simple, probably best guesses uh, for now, that you know the the thickness of the lithospheric mantle that is altered uh, here is indicated as 375 meters. Whether that's correct um, or wrong, we really don't know uh, right now. Um, and what the thickness of the altered oceanic crust is, we can learn a lot from these natural processes um, because um, there are. Uh, efforts for engineered um, ocean alkalinity enhancement, uh, carbon sequestration, mining of critical elements, but also a uh, fledgling hydrogen e economy. All these processes are taking place in nature and there's lots to be learned. I think there's a lot of opportunity for synergy um, from, uh, from these natural processes for um, 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 future efforts. So uh, needs, I think that key for um, the, our success to assess how much mantle rocks are present in slow spreading oceanic plates and what, uh, how deep alteration penetrates is, is they were able to access the subsea floor and that is um, either through geophysical means or uh, directly through uh, drilling um, and that uh, the success of the of drilling has been uh, shown uh, last year through IDP Expedition 399. Um, we're also lacking um, submersible that are 
um, able to operate into the Hadle zone. And there's lots to be learned from Hadle signs about uh, the, the uh, structure of the oceanic crust and how much of what rock type is um, being um, introduced into subduction zones, because the trenches are typically the oldest sections of the oceanic plates. And um, I'm not going to dwell on the dredging aspect that was already uh, covered by uh, um, the previous speakers. And I think there's lots of opportunities for partnerships. So NASA um, shows an increased interest in subsea floor science because there are similarities between hydrothermal processes um, that are occurring in our seafloor and that may occur on other planetary bodies and icy moons, for example, of um, Saturn and um, Jupiter. There's obviously also opportunities for partnerships with uh, NSF uh, Petrology and Geochemistry and the Office of Polar Programs. ARPA-E has uh, shown increased interest in um, hydrogen, uh, geologic hydrogen and uh, carbon sequestration, and ocean alkalinity enhancement. Um, that is uh, the same is true for industry. And then there's uh, certainly also opportunities for partnerships with foundations, but also international agencies with like um, the European Research Council and uh, IODP cubed. And with that, um, I'll stop here. Okay, good. All right, and that we'll we'll move on to uh, Jackie Captain Heilbach, please from Western Washington University. Jackie, you're there. Go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me here? Yes. Right. Let me turn this into presenter mode. Can you see the screen okay too? Yeah. Great. All right. Well, thank you all so much for for inviting me to be here and for the previous speakers. Um, I'm coming to you from Coast Salish lands are uh, people of the Northern Strait who have been the stewards of our land over here. And I'm gonna talk about uh, sort of, you know, material that crosses over with a lot of what you've already heard. I'm gonna talk a little about volcanism in the world's oceans. And when we talk about this, I'm gonna include sort of aspects that are mid-ocean ridge volcanism and ocean island volcanism and arc volcanism. And, and that includes both deep volcanism and those eruptions that actually cross the sea surface. So we're looking at something that sort of spans the full range of, uh, um, of regions there, of sort of the, the parts of the oceans. So, you know, one of the statistics I give in my classes a great deal and I hear people talk about is this one that something, you know, the numbers vary, but something on the order of 75% or more of the planet's volcanism occurs beneath the sea. And I think what that really means, because we actually don't have a great sense for what happens beneath the sea, I think really what that is saying is that the amount of igneous rock production is something on the order of 75% beneath the oceans. We have observed in our time, by which I mean actually, you know, visual observations by ROV or, um, yeah, largely by ROV, only two deep eruptions. We've had a handful of other eruptions for which there has been in situ instrumentation, but for the most part, we haven't had close up views on how these processes work. And so what I want to talk a little today is that we've got some major gaps in our understanding of these processes and their associated hazards, and to talk a little about what some of the best approaches we might have to addressing some really fundamental questions. Um, I very deliberately started with a, a satellite image here of the eruption plume from the Hunga Tonga eruption just a couple of years ago, because I think that really illuminated for us some of the significant hazards and the significant open questions that exist in, uh, in the world of submarine volcanism. So this is a figure from a recent review paper by Tepin Ziak, and this is showing something on the order of about 60 submarine volcanic systems that are known to have erupted in the last hundred or so years. And this is sort of all we know with respect to what types of eruptions there are um, in the oceans. 
Most of these you'll see are in ARC settings. So for example, the Marianas and the Kermadec ARC, um, there are some that are proximal to land elsewhere. For example, Axial Seamount in the Pacific Northwest. And um, this one calls it Loihi, now called Kamaehuakana Loa in Hawaii. A lot of what you're seeing here is a question of where do we have instrumentation? So we know from, again, Seafloor maps, which, you know, and, and, and other research, and of course, um, just our knowledge of plate tectonics, that there should be volcanism all over the seafloor. But what we see is really, really limited. And that probably has more to do with where we have instrumentation, what we've been able to observe. Um, I'll note that these come in a range of depths. These are color coded in this image. So the darker uh, triangles you see here are the deeper ones. So most of what we know are still these very shallow eruptions. So the vast majority of activity, which is on those mid-ocean ridges, we have never captured and we know very little about. So I wanna bring up some of the fundamental questions that I think we have about seafloor volcanic systems because these are gonna inform where we need to go forward. Most fundamentally, we simply don't know how often these volcanoes erupt, how frequently, with what volume, um, and again, in these different systems, ocean island versus mid-ocean ridge, et cetera. Um, this has implication for the global magma budget and the life cycle of oceanic crust, how much crustal production there is at the ridge, um, how much, of course, is subducted into, uh, into trenches on the other end. This has implication for volatile flux in terms of con you know, connections between the mantle and the seafloor, as, as we've heard actually from several of our previous speakers. And of course, connections, because volcanoes host these biologic and hydrothermal systems, there are implications for what we know about the biologic settings there, you know, if we only know how often these things act. When I started studying this stuff somewhere in the order of 30 years ago, we would we were told that there anything deep and say that's deeper than 500 or so meters must erupt effusively as opposed to explosively. We didn't think at those types of pressures we had a lot of explosive volcanism. And, and that has changed dramatically. We now know actually there's quite a bit of deep explosive volcanism, but we really know relatively little about how those processes work. Um, you're looking at an image here of a pumice raft that was uh, floated around over time as a consequence of eruption in 2012 from Havre volcano in the Kermadex. And this was a highly explosive silicic eruption um, from depth that generated a very large pumice raft, which was really the only indication we have that this thing had erupted to begin with. So we have a lot to learn about volatile flux and the relationships between volatiles and, and high pressure and these magmatic systems. Explosive volcanism, and for example, again, the Honga Tonga eruption and the Havre eruption have an impact on the sediment budget um, on the seafloor, the amount of material that is deposited from these explosive um, interactions and the types of deposits that we get. Hazards, um, I think like any volcanic system, of course, we know that simply the eruption plume, if it crosses into the atmosphere, can be hazardous. But of course, in the submarine setting, we have potential for tsunamis. We saw that in Hunga Tonga. We've seen that in, for example, the recent collapse of Anak Krakatau in Indonesia. Many of these are also associated with either sector collapse or submarine landslides. These are often very unstable systems. Pumice rafts that can have an impact on shipping. Um, we saw again in Hongatanga that the, the pyroclastic flows that were generated cut off communication to areas of Tonga because of their impact on sub, um, submarine communication cable. So understanding the hazards of these volcanoes is a really broad question. How often do these occur? How often do they impact our subsurface structures? What are the risks to communities who live, for example, in island and coastal nations? Ross brought this up, but I'll touch on it again, that, that we have a lot to learn um, really in a more sort of fundamental science capacity with respect to, for example, the subsurface structure of these systems, magmatic structures. We're looking at a couple of examples here of a, um, axial seamount in the upper image, that's a paper by Carbot and others, and then Schmidt et al. looking at a slow spreading volcanic system on the uh, Southwest Indian Ridge. 
we know relatively little about the longevity of magmatic systems, the depth, the location, the continuity along ridges of these systems. That again has implications for plate tectonic systems, for spreading rate, for the flux of magma, again, connecting the mantle to the sea surface. Um, hydrothermal systems, of course, have are impacted by where these systems lie, where we have the heat sources for hydrothermal activity. And of course, plume ridge interaction remains a really fundamental question in terms of how those two things might connect these magmatic systems. So these are really fundamental questions about how volcanoes behave in areas where we need instrumentation to, to be able to observe and answer these. So again, going back to something that Ross said, submarine volcanoes are in many respects simpler. They're easier to model. I have an image here of uh, West Mata, an eruption of West, West Mata volcano. And one of the extraordinary things here is that you could actually see these eruptive activities better because the water in the plume simply goes into the water and the seafloor. And we can see some of the activity happening better in respect, many respects than we can on land. But of course, they're extremely difficult to access. We would love to know about these systems without having to go out and do an individual study on every one, putting a few instruments somewhere locally, coming back later to see what happened while we were gone. So another image that I'll share from this review paper by Tevin Ziak um, are some examples of how we might use ocean bottom seismology and ocean bottom hydrophones or moored hydrophones that sit in the low velocity zone in the oceans to detect some of um, the seismic signals or infrasonic signals in the case of land-based um, instrumentation to understand submarine systems. And so I'll make a little bit of a case here for this instrumentation. We've heard about the need for uh, robust, um, newer, let's say, uh, less aging ocean bottom seism um, seismic pool. But I'll also add that there are uh, advantages to also understanding the sounds that these make. Hydrophones are an exceptional way to understand what goes on in the world's oceans. And I want to give just a, an example of this. Um, you're looking at, at a spectrogram here. So this is a time series across the top. We're looking at you know something on the order of several hours. You can see the amplitude of the um, acoustic signal. That's the sounds generated by a deep submarine volcano West Mata in the Tonga Arc. And then in the colors, you're looking at the frequencies of sound that it generates. So low frequencies at the bottom, higher frequencies at the top, and the amplitude of the signal is the volume of sound. Um, and so what you're looking at in this case is pulses in these broadband, these, these signals that range across frequencies, of the sounds of an eruption at West Mata. This is not a volcano we can see. This is not a volcano on which we have immediately proximal instrumentation. These were hydrophones that were deployed for several months at a couple tens of kilometers away. But we can see a pulsating signal that it gets loud and quiet and loud and quiet. And that changes sometimes in amplitude and duration of these signals. And work that was done on Northwest Rota 1 volcano, which is quite similar, this is work by Bill Chadwick and others, suggests that these types of eruptions have to do with slugs of gas that come out and burst through the um, either sort of a lava plug at the top or maybe fragmental material. So we may be looking at the signals of different slug size, different gas contents, different eruptive behaviors, simply by listening to these sounds. Another example in the same volcano shows a massive transition from a time where we had these repeating eruptive bursts to where we switch very, very suddenly to these very low frequency pulses that we attribute to magma bubbles, basically individual bursts, as opposed to more diffuse degassing, longer um, gas slugs. So simply by listening to these sounds, we can start to get a handle on some of these submarine processes that cannot be easily, easily observed even on land. So it's a real opportunity, I think, for us to get a better handle on volcanic processes more broadly. One more thing I'll leave with, um, this is an example from that same hydrophone network in West Mata. We can see four different stations, spectrograms showing things like T phases, that's an earthquake that occurred distantly, 
and this broadband signal in the middle. And if we look toward the bottom here, you can see these sort of swoops of, of frequencies that go from high to low. That's a process that has to do with the geometry between the source of the sound and the location of the receiver. And when sound bounces off the sea surface, it produces these um, constructive and destructive patterns that tell us what we're seeing here is a moving source. The fact that those frequencies change mean this moves. And this is one of the first images we have that allows us to, to track and understand the behavior of a submarine landslide in the deep oceans, that we know this is something that is sliding along the flank of the volcano. So by listening, we have a window into some of these potentially hazardous processes. So you've heard a bunch about these already. I'm gonna kind of reiterate some of them, some of the critical instrumentation that we have to understand submarine volcanic systems. Ocean bottom seismometers, like the one you see pictured here, um, are really a critical portion of our ability to do either campaign or potentially things like we have in the Ocean Observatories Initiative, cabled instrumentation that allows us to look at things in real time. Um, seismic studies also have the potential to we could do active source studies where we can shoot to these things with instruments such as the Langseth that allow us to really uh, get some high resolution detail in the structure of these systems. Again, I'm going to make this plug for hydrophones in the oceans. They allow us to record very, very broadly across all sorts of volcanic features. They're not limited to volcanism. This is also instruments that we can use to record earthquakes, to understand biological phenomena, again, submarine landslides. They provide us a baseline of the soundscape, which allows us potentially to get a better handle on how other activities such as seafloor mining might impact soundscapes. So we understand um, potential activity and potential impacts on uh, biologic systems. There are a lot of places, we do have a handful of long-term hydrophones, but many, many areas we cannot hear. Their sounds are blocked by bathymetry. Um, so just a few of these could have the potential to go much farther. And of course, I'll make one more plug for seafloor geodesy to get a better handle. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you're at 14. Oh, excuse me, sorry. I tend to get too talkative. I'm done anyway, that is the final slide. So <laughs> thank you for stopping me. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. That was a really fabulous uh, set of talks, and I really appreciated how you all wrapped in the societal re relevance, the uh, systems-based thinking, the basic science, um, and the infrastructure needed. So can we have a round of applause? So uh, we started a little late, so we'll go a little bit into the break time with questions. I am going to limit that to, uh, to committee members. Uh, and please raise your hand, as, as uh, Kelly mentioned, Tuba, you are first up. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you all, to all of the speakers. I also really appreciated that Jessica recorded her talk like she did. That was very informative. Um, uh, I have two sort of interrelated questions, and they really come from a place of um, the discussions we've had among the committee around um, who are audiences, right, for this report. Clearly, NSF is our sponsor, so Yes, um, but we also want to think about how to help NSF, um, you know, potentially get traction with getting more resources for this work. And so it, it, my question comes from, from sort of that place. And so I'm thinking about the folks I have recently talked to, um, you know, not scientists, and I've asked them about ways in which they feel themselves connected to some of this work. And there are two pieces, two questions that have come up in my sort of informal polling of folks. One is around predicting earthquakes. Everyone is definitely interested in that, right? People are, um, hey, even if we just had 15 minutes of advanced knowledge, like there's a lot you can do to save lives. So that's one. And then the second is, hey, can we put all of this extra CO2 back into the crust? What does that look like? So those are the sort of questions that I get from folks that I talk to who are well-educated people, but not ocean scientists. So where are we at along those uh, lines? Um, predicting earthquakes, are there folks, you, you, the, the four of you haven't talked a lot about modeling or forecasting. Where's the state of the, the science there? And then what about this idea of pumping CO2 into the crust? <laughs> 
Well, unfortunately, Jessica, I don't think is with us online. She was maybe going to try and join at the end, but I don't see her. Um, <laughs> Jackie Ross, do you want to take the predicting earthquakes? I can, I can start a little, Ross will fill in. Um, yeah, so I think Jessica's point is, uh, you know, the work that she talked about on the GOFAR transform is really important from the perspective of an understanding earthquake generation. As she pointed out, it is the most predictable place that we know. Um, that said, our primary, you know, oceanic transform faults are not our primary hazard with respect to oceanic earthquakes. You know, subduction systems are more important, but we may learn something about how those behave. You know, my cynical perspective is largely that predicting earthquakes will get us so far earthquake engineering is probably the more important thing to tackle in terms of safety i you know we we can't stop the earthquake incoming but we can stop it from causing damage so you know my personal perspective is that may not be the direction that is most important to go in seismic studies but i would invite others to i think it's important from an understanding how faults behave but i'll invite others who want to uh make a case that it's also important for prediction if they have that case Ross, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, I guess, make the clarification that um, earthquake forecasting is something that we can do and we can learn a lot about that from oceanic transforms. And the reason that transforms are useful, and Jessica made this point, is that they're relatively simple because ocean crust is relatively boring. It doesn't have this long um, kind of protracted history that continental crust does. So that's why oceanic transforms are really useful in the context of forecasting. And I think realistically, if, if you talk to a, to, a, to a seismologist, many of them will, will, will not use the word predicting. I don't think earthquake prediction is something that's helpful for us right now to think about. It, it's simply not a tractical, tra practical and tractable problem. So forecasting is really where, where we are. Um, and I think that's why in the oceans, oceanic transforms um, are useful. And, and as Jackie said, they're not the primary hazard themselves, although there are some places where they might be. Um, they provide us with a simple laboratory in which we can test ideas about the impacts of things like fluids um, and rheology. Thank you. Uh, Frida, do you want to comment on the uh, CO2 sequestration? Sure. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there is a uh, great potential to learn from natural processes, um, specifically mineral carbonation of uh, ultramafic rocks that are highly reactive in the presence of CO2. Um, you know, implementing um, CO2 injection below the seafloor is something that, uh, you know, um, is at various stages of development. But I think that there's lots of work that needs to be done in order to understand uh, what the potential pitfalls and consequences are. And so I think that, um, you know, we need to put more efforts in studying uh, the natural processes to understand uh, what we could potentially do to the C4 environment if we were uh, doing that at scale, right? I mean, Injecting CO2 in the subsea floor is not a is not necessarily, you know, a technically impossible uh, a challenge, but like doing that at scale that makes a difference for um, our atmosphere. Um, that is something, you know, it's just like the dimensions are very different. And like, if I can add to to the to the CO2 and kind of make that forecast uh, of of seismic um, uh, events, earthquakes, and CO2. We had a recent study uh, published in PNAS on um, uh, mineral carbonation of peridotite in the St. Paul's transform fault. And one of the main minerals that forms during mineral carbonation is talc. And talc is a, is a velocity uh, strengthening rock or mineral that will then um, uh, create conditions that, uh, that would cause um, a seismic creep, so limit earthquake behavior. We see similar things in the San Andreas Fault as well, actually. Great, thank you. Ross, did you have something else to add to this conversation? I, I did, yeah. So um, if we want to in inject CO2, CO2 responsibly, we need to be able to know where it's going in the subsurface. And the best tool for that is time-lapse seismic imaging. So that's taking a 3D survey before you start injecting CO2, injecting some CO2 and then doing the survey again. This is something that's routinely done in industry. 
in, in the context of CO2, so there's an experiment in the Sleipner field in, um, in the Norwegian North Sea where they've been doing this. But in the US, in the context of um, developing the workforce, if we don't have a 3D seismic vessel in academia, we have very limited ways in the academic community to do these kinds of experiments and train the next generation. So in, able to, in order to monitor um, CO2 injection, we have to have this kind of facility. Thank you, Russ. Brad. Um, hi, thanks, uh, Maya. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. good. Uh, so I think this question is for Russ, but others may pick this up as well, because several mentioned the issue of availability of ocean bottom seismometers. And, and I want to kind of pull at that thread a little bit to try to figure out what the key limitation is here, just thinking that it could be just simply money. There isn't enough to buy them, organizational, a national facility to kind of manage them. But the third would be kind of the development of new technology. What's constraining that? Is it private public partnerships? Anyway, I'll just throw that on the floor. Thanks. Thank you. Maybe so yeah, the, the limitation is that we we don't we simply don't have enough instruments to do the kind of high resolution experiments we want to do. And by high resolution, I mean you want to have instruments that are closely spaced. And there's lots of them, so we can get high resolution um, uh, data sets. There's just not enough of them. And so the current wait time to access instruments in that pool is on order of a couple of years. Um, and is it then, as so a couple of us mentioned, those instruments are old. And so it means that it's increasingly expensive to operate them. So um, these experiments get more and more expensive for every year that these instruments get older. Um, they require a lot of uh, human interaction to, to keep them operating, um, which is expensive. And we need to be moving to modern instruments that require less um, less, uh, less effort. But there are lots of other countries that build and operate them. I mean, is the, so higher quality instruments do exist. They just don't exist available in the US. Yeah. That is correct. Thanks. Yeah, if I can throw in, I was on a committee a couple of years ago talking about um, sort of new technologies that might come up in the world of, of ocean bottom seismology. And, you know, there are so many questions that people ask about, you know, global seismicity and seismicity on the seafloor that have potentially used different types of instruments. So, for example, we don't have sort of a global seismic network caliber um, seismometer that functions on the seafloor. Most of what we have are instruments that you know, they're high quality, but you drop them overboard and you come back and see what happened while you were gone. We don't have real time data. So advancing toward ways of either um, improving our real time um, assessment of seismic activity on the seafloor, potentially looking at ways of data transfer, or acoustic data transfer, transfer via cable. There's a lot of directions technologically that I think would um, are sort of one of the next directions that we can go to understand um, activity in these areas. And I think that potentially is, um, you know, a, a funding question as well. And to understand what the, the different needs are of the ocean seismic community. Thank you, thank you. All right, Ajit. Just to follow up on that before I ask my question, is there an industrial use for this? In other words, is there a potential where um, industry would need to know be the undersea cable or any of those other industries? Anybody? If not, I'll keep going with my the question I was going to ask. Um, because, the, the, the answer is yes. Um, industry use these things all the time. Um, there's a, a special kind of uh, OBS called a node. So they're very small. Um, the benefit of them is they're small, they're flexible. You can put lots of them on the seafloor. The bad part about them is they often don't have their own independent flotation package. So you need to have an ROV to go and, um, to go and uh, retrieve them. Uh, so they're a little bit more complicated. And there are um, there is the advent of distributed acoustic sensing, which is where we can use fiber optic cables to collect data on the seafloor. And that's really just beginning to come onto the scene. Um, and there's lots of potential there. Thanks. Um, so the question I had down was, um, we've been talking about things like carbon uh, removal or potential for uh, mining. Um, when you do these studies, um, are there um, biologists on board or how do you interact with folks who are studying the ecology of the systems that you are looking at through your lens of um, marine geophysics? 
Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the sort of the rationale behind that is that if we were to do any of these activities, do we know what it is that we would be disturbing? And I ask this question out of the idea that there's also potential for collaboration where we might make a where there's a potential for making a more robust case for some of the infrastructure needs, so on and so forth, if actually this is done in a transdisciplinary manner. So just getting a sense of what actually happens in the field. Anyone? Maybe I can. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, maybe you can comment on this. So yeah, there's the uh, Cobra network, uh, who is looking at um, the impacts of seafloor mining, but also um, carbon sequestration on the seafloor and sub seafloor biosphere. And there are uh, quite a few studies coming online now, where, um, you know, that topic is, is being uh, addressed, for sure. That's like, you know, the ecological impacts. But also, you know, um, other impacts, you know, you can imagine that like if you conduct seafloor mining, there's a lot of uh, dust and sediment that is being entrained into the water column that is being, because you do that at scale, um, you know, they're being, it's being transported kilometers away. So there are lots of different impacts. Um, but like, you know, there are also like you know, things that we don't really understand is like, you know, what if uh, you, you, um, you inject too much CO2 into a rock, uh, you know, what is the maximum capacity of the rock to to soak up CO2 before um, carbonates start dissolving again, and then you have the reverse effects and basically, you know, um, uh, don't accomplish your goals. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to yeah, thank you uh, very much for for all that. And and I, and I'm sorry if it's obvious. I mean, everyone else knows this, but I'm curious about the pace of these kinds of studies that you have been talking about. You've been very eloquent about the kinds of things needed, the equipment needed, the sorts of things you have to know in order to say do carbon sequestration safely and completely. But I have no idea whether you're talking about studies that will take five years or it will take ten years to get the equipment and then ten more years to do them. What what is the pace around which the kind of answers to these really fundamental questions are likely to be coming on board to be to be used uh, for the kinds of things you're talking about? Excellent question. Yeah, and I know there's no single and perfect answer to that, but then it's like I'm bringing up the topic. That's what I'm doing. I can chime in a little on on the volcanism aspect, Andy. You mentioned carbon sequestration, but stepping back um, to my little niche. You know, there was one of the figures I showed talked about the detection of submarine volcanism, and you could see this massive increase in the number of, of systems that we'd seen recently. And I think it doesn't take a lot of instrumentation for us to massively increase our understanding of these systems because our knowledge base is, is fairly sparse. Um, so, you know, with my sort of obsession of, of adding hydroacoustic networks, a single instrument can detect things globally. So a very small increase, I think, in the number of instruments that could record these sounds could massively increase our understanding of how frequent these things are and what other types of processes can be recorded um, audibly. So that's one example where I think things could happen relatively rapidly with a few more instruments. Cool. Rita Ross, go ahead, or if you want to address the carbon. Question. Sure. Um, yeah, I think that um, it's it's a good question. It depends on like um, you know what uh, scale of um, research project one would look at. Um, you know, there there are small scale projects that can help us um, better understand these processes on relatively short timescales. Also, because you know these reactions that are taking place are operating on relatively short timescales that are sort of on the the order of uh, human time scales, right? We, we cannot forget that, like, you know, some of these processes are taking a very long time and are difficult to observe. Um, but then there are um, integrated uh, larger networks like the Solid Carbon Network in Canada that has uh, done a tremendous uh, work on understanding, um, you know, what it takes storing carbon safely in, in the subsea floor. And um, they have made progress over, I want to say, the last five or 10 years. And, um, you know, that's kind of the timescales we're looking at. Thank you. I just wanted to comment on the timescales of, of eruptions. So um, 
For example, there's a study area on the East Pacific rise where I showed those 3D images. We think that system erupts every 10 to 15 to 20 years or so. And what we really like to do is monitor that system through time. So um, I know Maya did a lot of work in that area um, uh, during its last eruption cycle. But because we don't have enough ocean bottom seismographs, for example, um, we're not able to have, it's currently not instrumented. So we don't know what's going on in terms of the seismicity there. But the, the pace of these eruption cycles can be as quick as five to 10 years. So on axial seamount, for example, and these, these places where the, the eruption cycle is relatively fast on human timescales, um, we, can, we can tackle these problems. And I'll quickly speak on behalf of Jessica that she showed in that figure of the GOFAR transform that it's every few years that we get a good sized earthquake out there. So monitoring for with a good network for a few years has really high capacity to or likelihood of our capturing something that can be very informative. Okay, thank you all. Marsha. Um, yes, so I wanted, I wanted to ask about partnerships. Have you guys um, talked with the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization? Uh, they have uh, sensors, acoustic sensors on the SOFAR channel all over the world. And another partnership might be the Smart Cable Initiative. That's on the seafloor. That's in partnership with some telecommunications. I think it's mostly around Europe right now. Yeah, the test ban treaty, the the hydrophones that are used for that have been, you know, incredibly helpful. They are also still limited in extent. There are a few places that that those um, instruments are widely available. Um, they've also gotten much better recently at data availability. For a long time, that was a real challenge, and I think that's improving um, happily. Um, but there are still large gaps, so that's a great start. And a lot of the the examples that you saw in that figure from uh, Tep and Ziak come from, for example, the Wake Array. Um, but I, I think, yeah, that's a great start. And there are partnerships with them for sure, but we need more. Great. Thank you. So uh, we have two minutes left. So I'm, I'm going to just ask uh, one of the questions that didn't come up in, uh, with regard to hazards is actually the ability to forecast eruptions and whether or not what we're learning on the sea floor uh, is applicable to hazards on land as well. So either um, Jackie or Ross, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think very much so. And I think, again, the, the fact that there are simpler systems in the oceans can offer us a very nice, simple window into things. And again, you know, it's easier in some respects to study these processes in that environment. We really need seafloor geodesy, though, to get a better handle on forecasting of submarine volcanism, because uh, that's one of the really critical things for subaerial systems, for on land systems, and it is in its I would say nascent stages in the oceans. Um, having, you know, Ross mentioned the axial, uh, the axial network where we have real time data coming in. It's one of the maybe the only place that there has been the forecasting of a submarine eruption because of deformation data that were reported down there. And I think it's a great indicator that we can do these things with the right type of instrumentation. Thank you. Um, I just, one more minute since we have, I just saw a question in the chat from Kristen. Are there special needs for Arctic Ocean Geology and Geophysics research in like 30 seconds? Anyone? <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's, um, there are the under ice um, our AOVs that we have, right? And so I think that there is a greater need for under ice um, AOVs and ROVs. Um, that go to greater depths and that also are allowing us, particularly than under ice ROVs that allow us to take samples from the seafloor um, in the ice covered ocean, as long as it's ice covered. Great. Thank you so much again, everyone. Thank you for the extra time for this session. And thank you, Maya, for facilitating so expertly. Um, so we are five minutes past the half an hour. I think we have a break for yes. 10 minutes an hour. I've been accused to not allow it, that I don't allow enough breaks. So 10 minutes, folks, that's a long <laughs> time for a break. So just this just rest is right outside. We are back. Um, and we have a session now on ocean life. And I believe Ajit's going to facilitate. Thank you all for um, calling in.
um, the kind of speakers who are going to make the presentations. So the format will be 10 minutes of uh, presentation by the speaker, followed by a couple of quick questions. And then uh, we will use the time after all the speakers have spoken to have a more uh, general discussion. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Christy Coker from uh, UC Santa Cruz, who is actually in New Zealand and so has sent in her uh, recorded presentation uh, that we will begin with right now. Good morning. My name is Christy Croker. I'm a professor in ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. I apologize that I am sending a pre-recorded talk, um, but I am currently in New Zealand on sabbatical, and it's going to be about 3 a.m. my time when the meeting is actually occurring. So please send me any questions you have afterwards over email. So I was asked to talk about some of my research or my perspectives really on ecological change in dynamic environments as it relates to the work of the committee. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes highlighting the current state of knowledge and then address what I think are some big gaps in our understanding of marine ecology, at least in this changing world, as well as opportunities to really address these gaps in the coming decade. I thought I would start with this photo because I think it really captures my view of the world where this beautiful, productive kelp forest ecosystem is really the sum of many parts or species. And it's the species that are really embedded in this complex interaction network that shape the community structure and ecosystem function. Now, environmental change is fundamentally already impacting organismal physiology but understanding how this scales to affect communities and ecosystems is inherently challenging because of some of the complexity I'm gonna talk about today. But communities and ecosystems are already changing. So this is a photo of what used to be a lush, productive kelp forest ecosystem taken just a few years ago off the coast of California. So this photo was taken after the 2013 sea star wasting disease epidemic, where there was widespread mortality of sea stars across the entirety of the US West Coast. And then after the 2014-16 large marine heat wave. And this is just one photo of really hundreds of kilometers of coastline where kelp forest ecosystems literally disappeared and collapsed um, and have yet to recover. And collapses like these can have profound societal impacts. So just following through on this example of the Northern California kelp forests, after the collapse, there was the closure of the red abalone recreational fishery, which holds really significant cultural value for tribes in California and local people. And there was a federal uh, disaster designation for the red urchin fishery and so on. So these kinds of events or patterns really highlight what I think are two fundamental questions that marine ecology needs to address in our changing world. Now, the first is pretty basic, but it's critical in our ability to make predictions about the effects of global change at these higher levels of organization. And that's what are the mechanisms underlying ecosystem dynamics in nature? The second is much more applied, and essentially I'm asking as species move and ecosystem shift, what actions can we take to support continued function? Now I see two main challenges associated with this research agenda. First, environmental change is in itself complex and dynamic. So when I talk about environmental change, it's at least threefold, maybe four, depending on what kind of system you're talking about. And here I'm really talking about warming, deoxygenation, and acidification. And in the past decade, we've made a lot of progress studying the effects of what I'll call multiple stressors or multiple drivers on marine organisms, primarily thinking about warming and acidification. But much of this research has really been focused on these factorial combinations of temperature and pH that capture our current and future projections for the ocean. 
However, in nature, organisms experience a really different environment, and they often experience these unique combinations of the drivers associated with global environmental change that can vary in both space and time. Okay, so here I'm showing you a snippet of data collected from, again, following the theme, this Northern California kelp forest, um, where I'm showing you pH temperature and dissolved oxygen. And you can see that the data are very highly correlated. So as one factor goes up, so do the others and vice versa. There's a lot of temporal variability also happening here, which is different than much of what we see in our laboratory experiments. And much of this can be predictable from an organism's perspective, where the correlations and the dynamics um, are largely predictable, or they can be less predictable, such as the pattern that I'm showing you here in large marine heat waves for the U.S. West Coast over the last 40 years or so. So research on organismal responses to environmental change that are focused primarily on these IPCC relevant scenarios for future oceans don't tell us very much about how marine organisms are going to respond when they're embedded in these dynamic multivariate environments. So to understand species responses in these type of environments, you need to understand their responses over a much wider range of conditions than these current and future. So we have a pretty good understanding of the shape of organismal responses to temperature. Here I'm showing you a really typical thermal performance curve. We know that generally performance is going to decline in response to uh, decreasing dissolved oxygen saturation um, with some variability depending on kind of how the organism copes with that. And generally we expect that performance will decline with acidification at some unknown threshold, but we have very little understanding of what the shape of that actual uh, response surface is. And then finally, we have an even more limited understanding of how these environmental conditions affect performance together in really environmentally relevant ways for organisms. And I think this provides a really uh, exciting opportunity to support interdisciplinary programs that pair oceanographic observations, especially in the coastal ocean where we have far fewer with organismal and population level studies that are really relevant to these dynamic multivariate environments. Coming back to this kelp forest, the second challenge I really see is moving from those organismal and population level responses to better predict emergent effects at the community or ecosystem scales. So several studies have highlighted the importance of species interactions in particular in driving these emergent responses to environmental change. Here I'm showing you a couple of photos from some of my early work where we studied the effects of acidification using these natural carbon dioxide vents. So similar studies have been undertaken on coral reef and other rocky reef ecosystems. And there are lots of approaches that might move this research agenda forward, including these types of studies in natural analog systems, whether we're talking about carbon dioxide events or natural gradients, or larger mesocosm style studies that really incorporate multiple species interactions. It can be challenging to capture all of the interactions in an experimental setting. So another approach is to really focus on what I'm calling an ecological leverage point here, or the key species interactions that have a disproportionate effect on the community or ecosystem. In addition, I think we could shift our thinking from species to traits, which can then provide insight into functions, rates, energy flows, how those might shift with environmental change which again provides really exciting opportunities for generalizing across ecosystems. So together, I think that there are important opportunities to support programs that really address the mechanisms, the functional consequences, and the cross ecosystem comparisons of community and ecosystem change. Now, we were all taught in our ecology classes about the feedbacks between observations and experiments, where observations guide our experiments and experiments can guide our observations. 
And additionally, I think modeling and synthesis have a really important play to role here, or a role to play here. So it's clear that our observations and experiments feed into our synthesis and modeling. And again, I think that those models and synthesis should then be guiding also some of our observations and experiments. And it's through these feedbacks, you know, really, really across all of these that we're going to gain the most insight into predicting and responding to the emergent effects of global change. In terms of infrastructure and workforce development, there's been far less investment in the long term monitoring of the biology than the oceanography because it requires people and it's time intensive. However, having long term records and flexible opportunities like the rapid program to make observations is going to be really critical for progress um, as we move forward and uh, change continues to occur. Similarly, investments in infrastructure to do larger scale multi-stressor experiments is needed. Here I'm showing a small photo of CSIM, which is housed at the Australian Institute of Marine Science. And to the best of my knowledge, the US does not have something comparable. Beyond laboratory infrastructure, continued investment in field studies that compare across scales, I'm thinking kind of genes to ecosystems here are needed. And then finally, continued investment in synthesis centers is really important for moving the field forward, generalizing findings, and workforce development that centers diversity, equity, inclusion is going to foster new ideas and forward progress. With that, I'll say thank you, and I hope to hear from some of you soon. Thank you, Christy, who's recorded. Um, quick questions before we move to the next speaker. Um, that's true. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. Um, <laughs> next speaker is Sonia. Who will be able to answer the question? Thanks, Sonia. Please take it over. Hello, everyone. Hopefully, you can hear me, and my screen is sharing properly. It's really a pleasure to be able to participate today, and I um, am a professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Columbia University, but I've also included here my affiliation with the NSF Science and Technology Center for my chemical currencies of a microbial planet to acknowledge the discussions I've had with my center collaborators on the content of this presentation and related discussion. You've already heard about genes to ecosystems and the importance of understanding mechanisms. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today under the theme of identifying the rules that govern the ocean's chemical microbe network. So there is a vast chemical microbe network that underpins everything from marine food webs to biogeochemical cycling in the ocean. In every one milliliter sized drop of seawater, there are about 10 to the six microbes and about 10 to the 10 viruses. The scope of the biology is vast. Equally vast is the chemistry. There are about 100,000 different molecules in that drop of seawater of varying concentrations, acting as substrates and signals as those microbes talk to each other and carry about those marine food web processes and biogeochemical cycling. And together, there are myriad interactions in that network that we know are important, but many of which have not been resolved. Again, these interactions include the exchange of substrates that sustain biomass and energy flow and elemental cycling, and signals that alter microbial activities, and thus how the network is functioning. This network is critical to ocean processes from the surface to the subsurface. But for today, I will use an example with surface carbon just to highlight the global significance of understanding this network. So every year, about 50 petagrams of carbon are fixed by phytoplankton in the surface ocean into the critical compounds or metabolites that run those cells' cellular metabolism. 
then we're not sure, but upwards of 50% of this metabolite carbon is released to the dissolved phase where these are metabolites are rapidly cycled, potentially back to CO2. But while we have numbers on the fluxes of some of these patterns here in this graphic, they are very poorly constrained. And in fact, we do not understand the rules or mechanisms well enough with which these systems operate to go out and predict the fate of this carbon in any given environment well enough. And it is already a changing environment, as you've heard. These uncertainties are ever more critical to resolve. For example, the research strategies identified in this 2021 consensus study for ocean-based carbon dioxide removal, which include artificial upwelling, alkalinity enhancement, nutrient fertilization, among others, all of these intersect with the chemical microbe network and how it functions. We need to know how this network is working. So when I look to the next 10 years, I think it's critical to identify rules or mechanisms that govern this the ocean's chemical microbe network to build in the predictive power that we need. And to understand this globally important network, we must move beyond inventories of looking at what biology is there, what chemistry is there, to process level knowledge. This requires integrating observational and chemical and experimental studies across chemistry, biology, and modeling to build predictive power. I apologize that I've lost the lights in the room. I am remote and I'm not quite sure why that happened. All right, so there is a confluence of both need and opportunity here for looking out over the next decade where evolving methods the so-called omic methods will allow new progress in terms of being able to visualize this network. Now, we can't go out with microbes and molecules and look and see visually what is happening. I wish we could, but our way of visualizing this network includes molecular methods. So what I've done here, and this, as you can see in this graphic, is pull out a cell and show on a molecular level how that cell is interacting with its chemical environment. And I wanna take a couple of minutes to go through this. So as that cell interacts with its environment over very long-term time scales, we have chemical pools and the chemical environment that could influence the content of the genome. So what genes are there? This is the DNA. We can measure both the organisms that are present and the functions or genes that they carry using a method called genomics, or we put a meta in front of it if we're talking about doing that at the whole community level at once. Now, on shorter time scales, that cell is interacting with its chemical environment, receiving signals and substrates and altering its metabolism accordingly. And what is happening there is different genes or units in the genome are being turned on into the RNA or the transcriptome. And we can use metatranscriptomic approaches to look at the abundance of functions that are expressed or turned on by different organisms in a bulk sample. Now, that transcriptome pool is pretty amazing because it's like an activity readout for the cell, but we can go even further down this biological cascade and look at which of those transcripts are translated into proteins. Proteins are the enzymes and transporters that are doing the work of the cell, including synthesizing key chemical metabolites. And we can look at the protein level with proteomic assays. This measures the abundance of proteins, but it is dependent on databases derived from the measurements above, either the transcriptome or the genome. Last in this cascade, we have the biosynthesis of the metabolites. Here, this is the abundance of metabolites in cells, endo or seawater, exo. 
And those metabolites are produced to do the work of the cell, as well as being released in the cycling of carbon in the surface ocean. Now, I have an asterisk on some of these, and that is to highlight that I we find that these functions are determined based on database comparisons with distantly related microbes, often the model microbe E. coli. So you look at a sequence and you compare it to another and another and another, and you say, aha, I know what this is because this sequence is related to a sequence in E. coli. Obviously, marine microbes are not E. coli, and this presents a challenge. Another important point I wanna make here is that these methods when applied together in what I call a multi-omic approach are really critical for moving from the inventories where we just look at different steps in this pathway to looking at processes. So the challenge is that the chemical microbe network underpins ocean ecosystem functions and the earth's biogeochemical cycles but we lack predictive power on a changing planet. The opportunity here is that we have the mechanisms and set of methods to look at identifying the rules that govern this network's function and its sensitivities. I see three major facets to this moving forward on a decadal scale. This would be investment in methods and model systems for resolving the network, expanding capacity to observe the network across timescales for linking with predictive models, and capacity building in data infrastructure and integration. So that first idea, I just want to flush out with three facets. The first is focused on funding the development of genetic systems to develop a marine E. coli we can look at plant the plant uh, community and they have invested in key model systems that have genetic resources to understand those in concrete ways. We know about the E. coli model. Let's build out models more concretely for this marine microbial network. If we can resolve functions better, this increases our view of this biological cascade. The next facet is to support continued chemical method development and link metabolites to their production and uptake processes. So this is, again, that multi-omic observation integrated with the chemistry that really gets at processes. Last, we want to look at sensitivities. So test network sensitivities with model communities in the lab for feeding into models across scales. So cellular models can be developed with all of the resources I've shown here, and those can then be integrated into larger ecosystem models. The second facet I wanna talk about is expanding the capacity to observe. And this also has three components. If you remember nothing else, I think this next one is most important, and that is to support coincident multi-omic observations at the, as a core component of the time series, for example, at BATS and HOT. This would provide a critical process level view about what is going on with the network. I would also add that identifying network sensitivities with enhanced process studies on top of the time series observations would be critical because this allows us to push and pull on that network and observe it in its dynamic nature. Last, we need to work to integrate models across scales to better predictive capacity. So that is taking those cellular models and scaling them out in a systems context. The third facet I wanted to mention, again, was capacity building. And this is supporting method intercalibration and data integration tools. So how do we link all of those different measurements together and how do we calibrate them so that we know the measurements I made are comparable to the measurements made by somebody else? We need to expand frameworks for discoverable derived data products. Right now, 
the discoverable data is largely unprocessed. You have to go all the way back to raw data in order to confirm or use that data in a different analysis. And last, an important component of thinking about this is training in computational biology for early career researchers. We need oceanographers who are trained in the next generation of methods. I'll last just highlight what I see as some key partnership opportunities. This includes cross-directorate opportunities with bio, particularly around model systems. Also interagency opportunities. I wanna highlight here the DOE and a number of their programs and investments shown there in green that I think would provide key leverage or points of intersection on partnerships with OCE. I'll also highlight that there's been substantial investment by private foundations in this space in the US and uh, the Simons Foundation and the Gordy and Betty Moore Foundation have provided some of the initial impetus into driving some of these methods forward. I also think we can look to the international consortia like the Terra Oceans Foundation as other partners in this type of work. I last just wanna think as I end about data and highlight partnership opportunities there. This includes analysis. So for example, my group uses this advanced cyber infrastructure for HPC level analyses, but there it's constantly running out. We use up our data allotments quickly and it requires access to HPCs with high memory nodes to do this kind of work. I'll also note that the OCB program is already supporting with a workshop and intercalibration effort, and more of this type of investment is needed. And I'll end with saying, once you have all that data analyzed, it needs to be discoverable, and there are ongoing developments in that space that could serve as partnerships for OC moving forward. So I'll just finish by saying, I think there's a confluence of both need and opportunity to more fully resolve the rules which govern the chemical microbe network. Collectively, this knowledge will help better predict ocean resiliency on what is already a changing planet. Thank you. On the next speaker, Mike, and we'll come back to questions. Uh, I hope you can uh, stick around for the questions uh, in a little bit. So yeah. we'll come back to questions after we finish with the speakers. Mike. All right. Uh, thanks, Sonia, for giving a great overview. I, I agree with everything Sonia said and hope to build on it some. I've been tasked with discussing both the microbial loop and marine biogeochemical modeling, so I'm going to do my best to talk very fast. I want to start by giving a little bit of an overview of kind of how our understanding of the microbial loop paradigm has evolved. It was really only in the 1980s that we started to understand that bacteria are abundant and that the microbial loop exists. And then in the 1990s, we started to realize it's important for nutrient re remineralization. And it was really the 2000s that brought the understanding that protists are actually the dominant grazers of phytoplankton and potentially controlling primary productivity in the ocean. And in the 2010s, we saw a lot of new work into viruses and an understanding of the way that viruses actually work to enhance microbial diversity. And now in the 2020s, we're seeing a lot of new research into things like species level interactions, predator to prey interactions, parasite host, or specific characteristics of organisms that interact with biogeochemistry. Associated with this, we're seeing that protists also act to promote diversity. It's not just viruses. We're also seeing a lot of important research into the role of particular microbial hotspots, like on sinking particles. And we're also getting a greater understanding of the prevalence of mixotrophy as a common nutritional strategy and the way that's breaking down our understanding of phytoplankton as being different from zooplankton. So what kind of advances are needed? Well, well, first I wanna point out that our current autonomous platforms do not study the microbial loop. Biogeochemical Argo, for instance, is really geochemical Argo. And our imaging gliders and imaging floats at this point can't resolve things at a high enough resolution to resolve microbes. 
So we need investment into next generation autonomous platforms. And that can include things like low powered versions of the imaging flow cytobot that can be coupled with onboard machine learning and hence send us back estimates of abundances of microbes in real time, as well as potentially autonomous collection and perhaps even in the future at some point, onboard sequencing of DNA and RNA. But in the meantime, it's important to keep in mind that ship-based process studies and time series observations remain crucial, particularly those that link omics and imaging uh, paired with rate measurements. I want to highlight some of the recent things that we can really only do with shipboard measurements. This, these figures here show results um, showing taxon-specific variability in protistin grazing across a productivity gradient. So we see that bacteria, Prochlorococcus, Synecococcus, and Pico eukaryotes all respond differently in terms of grazing mortality to a change in productivity gradient. This graph here is um, from a study that's showing taxon-specific bacterial chemotaxis towards complex polysaccharides. So this is getting at that idea of linking microbes mm -hmm. and, chemi uh, and chemicals that Sonia was discussing. Finally, this study shows cellular level responses of diatom taxa to ocean acidification, showing that ocean acidification may affect how well diatoms can uh, take up iron and how they respond to this micronutrient. And these are all the sorts of things that we can only uncover with ship-based measurements. And really one of the key things that we need to do in the future is figure out how to synthesize these microscale results into process level understanding of how biogeochemical function varies in space and time. Or as Sonia would have said, what is the process level understanding of the rules governing these microbe chemical interactions? Next, I wanna talk about why it is that we should care about any of this. And the first reason that you should care is that obviously the oceans take up a lot of carbon. If we look at our ocean models and how they predict um, the biological carbon pump, they tend to almost all predict a weakening of the biological carbon in the future, but they differ drastically in their current estimates of, a, of the magnitude of the biological carbon pump, which suggests that there may be things that are missing. And I think it's important to keep in mind that they may be missing some mechanisms that we see in time series studies. For instance, the graph at the top here shows export flux measured in a time series off the California current. And what we see in that time series is that episodic pulses of export are becoming more common. And sequencing results actually showed that when there was a high pulse of export, it was dominated by one genus of diatom by Thalassia syra. And in fact, that study was confirmed by a in complete independent study that showed that, Th that Thalassia syra was the only common euphotic zone microbe that was consistently enhanced in sinking particles. So maybe this one genus of diatoms has characteristics that make it crucial to sinking export flux, possibly the fact that it's digestion resistant. Results from um, the, uh, the BATS time series in the Sargasso Sea show that even though net primary production is decreasing, a shift to cyanobacteria over eukaryotes as the dominant phytoplankton is driving an increase in the carbon to phosphorus ratio, which means that export flux of carbon is remaining relatively constant despite the fact that phosphorus supply is decreasing. This is something that we can't see in any of our autonomous platforms. We need shipboard measurements uh, to measure this. At the uh, Hawaii Ocean Time Series site in the North Pacific Subtropical Gyre where we'd expect net primary productivity to be decreasing, we actually see a long-term increase in net primary productivity, particularly in the deep euphotic zone, and that's leading to relatively constant export ratios over time. So we're not necessarily seeing the predicted decrease in export because of mechanisms uh, that often may be missing in these models. It may be that the models will, that the ecosystem will eventually adjust the way the models predict, but we could be missing some of these key mechanisms that we're understanding now from the microbial loop. Another reason that you should care about this is that ocean models are predicting future declines in phytoplankton biomass and that these future declines will actually be amplified at higher trophic levels. And this is important when we think about feeding humanity. The ocean models are suggesting substantial declines in fisheries production. And this is caused in part by food chain elongation that's driven by a strengthened microbial loop. At the same time that we're leading to less 
overall photosynthesis in the ocean, these models are predicting that we'll see a shift towards smaller phytoplankton. And as we shift towards smaller phytoplankton, we insert more protistin trophic steps and we dissipate more energy through the microbial loop. But it's important to keep in mind that these predictions are all based on CMIP class ocean models that do not explicitly simulate the microbial loop or food web reorganization due to climate change. There could be shifts in interactions and predator to prey size ratios that actually ameliorate some of these changes. And these are things that we cannot see in our current models and that we need to get from process level understanding of the rules of reorganization of micro microbial communities. So what are some future modeling advances? How can we start working uh, towards closing some of these knowledge gaps? Well, I think one of the key things that we need to think about is adaptive parameterization. When I talk about adaptive parameterization, what I mean is thinking about how key parameters in the model, such as phytoplankton half saturation constant, vary in time and space. And there are multiple ways that we can approach this idea of adaptive parameterization. One potentially fruitful approach is to use machine learning and artificial intelligence um, approaches to variable parameterization. So the idea here is to have to allow the uh, these advanced artificial intelligence approaches to figure out how something like half saturation constants may vary in time and space. Another approach is to use massively multi-parameter ensemble modeling. So instead of saying we know the half saturation constant, we say, well, there's this envelope of potential half saturation constants that might be possible out there and run a whole series of different models. Another possibility is to use emergent properties type models. And what these models do is they allow community evolution through the simulation of thousands of stochastically parameterized microbes so that as the environment evolves, the microbial community itself can evolve and the overall half saturation constant of that community can evolve mechanistically in space and time. But ultimately, the goal of this is a mechanistic understanding of how integrated properties of the microbial loop dynamics underlie regional and temporal biogeochemical variability. And this can come from these modeling approaches, or they can come from more targeted experimental work at sea and time series approaches, some of which Sonia already talked about. I think another real key to moving forward is very close integration with observations. We need to integrate our models with our observations. And the question becomes, how do we map high resolution imaging data and gene sequencing observations to our model structures. It's important to keep in mind that our models are not simulating genes. They're not simulating transcripts. They're not simulating proteins or metabolites. How do we link those two? This, may re this is almost certainly gonna require standardization of our observational methodology so that we can compare across studies and use those as validations in global models. But it also will absolutely crucially require that we train a generation of oceanographers that have co-fluency in machine learning image recognition, in interpretation of omics data, and in advanced modeling approaches. Because if you want to use the omics data to validate your model, you need to understand not only your model, but where that omics data is coming from and how it links to your model. And for this reason, I think that functional genomics and functional transcriptomics become potentially way more important than simply the 16S, 18S sequencing of asking which taxa were there. And finally, I want to end with some suggestions of uh, potential partnerships. One, of course, is with no, no fisheries. I think that it's going to become imperative to start linking the microbial loop with ecosystem-based fisheries management. Ecosystem-based fisheries management is important, and I think we're now starting to see an understanding of where the microbial loop fits in that. There's also obvious partnerships with NOAA and the Department of Energy for climate modeling, because the microbial loop is obviously an important energy dissipation pathway that affects uh, the global climate models. We can, of course, partner with NASA and the PACE mission. We can also partner with NSF TIP. Both image processing and environmental set sequencing are both big data frontiers. Ocean modeling is also pushing the frontiers of computational uh, feasibility. So there's a lot of potential partnerships with computing. 
Microbial functional analyses also yield diverse use cases, including things like environmental radiation, remediation, like after oil spills. Uh, Sonia already talked about marine carbon dioxide removal applications and aquaculture applications may be important as well. I also think that there are that we're well positioned now to start linking with NSF biology because our ability to investigate species specific relationships suddenly takes the microbial loop as something that really wasn't super interesting to the biologist because it didn't get at those relationships and now push, positions as it, it as an ideal laboratory for investigating these ecological principles in part because of the rapid turnover time and the way that we can study things across generations of our organisms. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Um, any quick question? Other questions? Go ahead, Jason. So, Mike, I'm curious when you say linking the microbial loop to ecosystem based fisheries management, what you specifically had in mind. So, in an ecosystem based fisheries management, the goal now is often to move away from simple single species modeling in which say tuna are modeled based on, well, what's the abundance of adults and that'll predict the abundance of larvae. But now to understand the survival of larvae at their critical early feeding stages, you may wanna to link to oceanographic conditions, including things like prey availability. The microbial loop fundamentally shifts the efficiency with which energy can be partitioned from phytoplankton up to something like peaceless stomatoid copepods or cladocerans or appendicularians, all of which might be preferred prey for the larval tuna. So understanding how the microbial loop might change in time and space allows us to predict the efficiency of energy pathway from the primary producers to the prey of the larval tuna and hence predict at that early critical stage that's crucial for the species, will uh, we have sir, will we have enough prey to support growth of uh, first feeding larvae? So that's kind of the way I see the linkages. Does that answer your question? Pardon, thank you. Do you have questions? Like, yeah, yeah. We, we, we can come back with more questions. Um, we've moved on to Eric. Yeah, let me see if I can share my screen here. How's that? Everybody with us? Yes. Cool. Um, all right. So again, first of all, uh, a second to everything that has already been said. Um, but I would like to bring all of that into the largest habitat on Earth, which is the deep ocean. Um, I'm going to be focusing on the benthos. We heard a lot about um, pelagic habitats in, in the midwater and the microbial loop, which uh, dominates out there. But I want you to start thinking about things that happen also in the dark. Um, what you're looking at is a giant coral reef um, in the deep ocean that the stuff at the top there is not the surface of the ocean. That's a giant school of fish uh, that's swimming around there. And so we're going to start um, thinking about some of these habitats in the benthos. Um, so the last decade went pretty well. Uh, we have come up with really major advances in our knowledge of the distribution and the controls on the distribution of some of these species and where we could find these habitats in the Upper right there, you're looking at a recent uh, predictive habitat model for the major reef forming corals of the deep ocean around the globe. And they're uh, sort of a definition of their niche, what kind of um, habitats they can occupy and where we expect to find them. And a lot of those places are greatly unknown and unexplored, even within the US EEZ. Over the last decade, we've also realized that um, in addition to the great diversity that's in the deep sea, which we've known about since the 60s and the, the um, transects from the Woods Hole to Bermuda and, and all the coring that was done out there, um, we've now discovered that there aren't just a lot of species, there are a lot of habitats. There are coral reefs, 
Um, the one that we found off of the East Coast a couple of years ago when the mapping was finally completed is about the size of Maryland, 26,000 square kilometers. That's inside the U.S. exclusive economic zone. We have a coral reef off of the East Coast of the U.S. that's that size, up to 100 meters high. Um, in that same area, there are canyons, there are cold seeps. A decade ago, we thought that we knew about you know, maybe a dozen cold seeps around the U.S. now because we've been able to map those, um, it, mapping the water column and looking at the bubble plumes coming off of the seafloor. We know there are thousands, if not tens of thousands of individual cold seep sites that are releasing methane into the water column. Some of that methane is even making it into the atmosphere. <clears throat> um, and understanding those dynamics is really critical as we move forward. I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, we have an increased understanding of some of the stability and instability of the deep sea. We have a few examples of time series, very few. Um, one of them came after the Deepwater Horizon, where we were able to actually measure, you know, coral growth. We were able to look at behavior of brittle stars and some of the other associates on the corals and some of these dynamics that play out on annual scales in an environment that we thought of as being really completely static on lo much longer time scales. Um, the other example of that instability is in the bottom right here, and this is the uh, Tonga eruption that affected the hydrothermal vents of the Lao Basin and uh, Roxanne Bayonart when they went back there, uh, when they were finally able to get back there after COVID. Um, a is the before picture and B is after. C is before and D is after. And this is uh, a major event that is not all that infrequent. And some of the, the deep sea is not just this static place. Yes, things happen on relatively slow time scales. Um, yes, you know, mostly because of the temperature, all the metabolic rates slow down, but things change down there. Um, there have been some global efforts to standardize uh, deep ocean data. Um, we heard a little bit about that, and these are sort of the you know essential ocean variables. What do you measure um, with the expense and the sort of rarity of access to the deep ocean? This is even more important that we can have interoperable data. The Challenger 150 Ocean Decade Program, which is based out of Europe, but is very active in the U.S., uh, is one that's trying to standardize the collection of benthic uh, ecological and oceanographic data. Um, DEUCE is another one that I know you guys are familiar with. They're having their meeting now <laughs> this week. Um, and so that's moved forward, and that's I think we're on a good path there. Uh, we've also... A, great increase in industrial activity. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that a bunch more coming up, but we also saw the rise of the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative led by Lisa Levin out of Scripps uh, and the really amazing work that they've done and now bringing the deep ocean kind of into people's thought process if we start to look at marine genetic resources, especially in areas beyond national jurisdiction, as we start talking about mining and Oil and gas is not stopping anytime soon, although we've seen somewhat of a reduction in leasing in U.S. waters. They're still very active and moving into a lot of places in around the world that um, have much less oversight. So that's the past. Um, I think for the next decade, just some of the types of questions that we could start addressing we have that sort of predictive capacity for where those species are, but we don't understand the mechanisms. And you've already heard this in the uh, last couple of speakers. Um, we need to really have a much better understanding of why those species are there, um, the interactions between the different drivers, not just these correlative models, which um, I use them a lot and they've gotten us really far, but we need to move beyond that if we're going to understand um, their response to the environment, which is next. Um, anyway, that predictive capacity for species and habitat distributions that goes beyond just species. We're talking about predicting where community types would be. And that also involves understanding some of the biological interactions. 
you kind of take that for granted in shallow water, but in the deep sea, our presence there is so sporadic and in such a small time scale normally that we never really make behavioral observations. Um, we don't understand how species interact unless we can tell some other way with some proxy like stable isotope food web modeling. We, that gets us predator and prey, but we don't understand competition in the deep sea. We don't understand a lot of the positive species interactions that could occur. All of those ecological, really foundational ecological principles are not known in the deep ocean because we're never there and we can't make those kinds of observations. Um, we have to understand that to understand how it's going to be affected by ocean change the marine heat waves that are extending into the deep ocean, just at even 700, 800 meters, uh, on that giant coral reef I was talking about, we measured 10 degrees Celsius temperature fluctuations over the course of hours. That is a major shock to a system that is used to a relatively stable environment. Now I said that, yes, things change. That's a really major change. And we didn't understand that that could even occur, but those heat waves are gonna extend it deeper into the deep ocean and they're gonna happen more frequently. Ocean acidification, of course, is a really uh, critical thing in the deep ocean because it lies so close to that aragonite saturation horizon. We have deep water corals that are still forming their skeletons in undersaturated waters, and we don't really understand how they're doing that and what that really means. Um, ocean deoxygenation is a huge issue. We know that this has been responsible for major mass extinctions in the past, and those oxygen minimum zones are getting more intense and they're getting larger, and that's been measured year to year, and that's just going to keep happening in the future. The biggest question here is what are the thresholds for those key, especially habitat forming species, commercially exploited species in the deep ocean? when are we going to go past some of those tipping points? Like I said, we already crossed the saturation horizon in a lot of deep sea communities, um, but the corals seem, some of them seem to be able to tolerate that. So what is the threshold? Where does that lie? We made some assumptions about that that ter are turning out to maybe not be true. Um, more directly, the impacts of human activity uh, oil drilling, again, is continuing. Even siting offshore wind is going to be an issue, and the environmental impacts are not just in the water column, not just birds and mammals. They're on the seafloor as well. Much more minor than drilling, don't get me wrong, but still something that needs to be looked at. Um, deep sea mining you know, is expanding uh, worldwide. It's getting ready to get going. I think you guys know all of that, but there are areas within the US EEZ that could be mining targets too. And those are not really subject to some of the international policies on deep sea mining. So how are we gonna handle that? Um, the marine uh, CDR, we've already talked about that a little bit. Um, that has in a lot of these sort of carbon cycling um, kinds of models, the deep sea is just this big black box. It goes down there and it's gone and we don't have to worry about it anymore. That has major impacts. All of that carbon coming down there in whatever form it's deposited has major impacts on the communities down there. It changes the entire dynamics of the food web. You're having this major carbon subsidy and a carbon limited environment. There are really significant implications for that that we don't understand. And a lot of these experiments are moving forward without any monitoring on the seafloor to see what their effects are. Um, and the major priority that answers a lot of these questions is interdisciplinary quantification of ecosystem services in the deep ocean. Um, again, you're looking at, this is a summary from Andrew Thurber um, that's about 10 years old now. That's looking at just a couple of the types of ecosystem services in the deep ocean. But then these are extractive resources primarily. Um, but we don't understand, we haven't quantified them really anywhere in the deep ocean. And again, the largest habitat on earth obviously plays a major role in global nutrient cycling. Um, oh yeah, here's our black box. Sorry, this is our normal carbon cycle, all of the familiar components. And then here's sinking and decay. 
and this big deep ocean and sediments on the seafloor. Well, they're not just sediments, they're canyons, they're massive coral reefs, they're cold seep habitats, they're landing on hydrothermal vents, they're landing on all of these different types of hard substrata, not just getting buried, they're getting metabolized. In some cases, that carbon's coming back up to the surface. This is a very much incomplete picture of our carbon cycle. Um, so how do we do that? I think more integrated interdisciplinary initiatives, um, something that we saw in the hydrothermal vent community were these integrated study sites where basically everybody worked together in one area to fully quantify all the processes in the East Pacific Rise, in the Juan de Fuca Ridge, in the Lao Basin. Um, I think we could take that approach with other types of ecosystems in the deep ocean. The resources are limited. That area is vast. Let's pick a couple places where we can really nail down what's happening at a methane seep or at a deep sea coral reef or within a canyon. Where are those places that we can concentrate? So we aren't learning about different habitats that may or may not be comparable. Um, yes, and then once we have really that basic understanding of the mechanisms that are underlying this, we can test them in other systems and see how broadly applicable they are. But right now we're collecting data in lots of different places that we cannot synthesize. Um, improved measurements of biogeochemistry, physiology on the seafloor. This is getting at that mechanistic question. This is really looking at carbon cycling, nitrogen cycling, phosphorus cycling, all those things in a mechanistic quantitative way on the seafloor. What you're looking at on the right here is a benthic lander. This is from Niaz. Um, that's for Mienis standing there uh, and her postdoc. And they we essentially made a deal with them to borrow this for a major research project because these types of uh, free vehicles are largely not available in the U.S. And there are none of them that are part of a central bank of equipment and not in the you know national deep submergence facility woods hole has some of these but they're not you basically they're not freely available and they're not publicized as hey anybody can come use this check this off and you know we will pay for this to go out on your cruise these are the kinds of instruments that we need to have a consistent presence on the seafloor to be flexible in the types of measurements that we're making um and to really start to understand and quantify some of these processes. That goes along with the next one, this longer time series, and not just making individual measurements when we have a 12 hour dive on the seafloor. That's all we're getting right now without these kinds of more persistent uh, landers. The ocean observatories are great, but there aren't very many of them and they're incredibly expensive and, um, I know people have varying opinions of them. I haven't seen a ton of bang for the buck, honestly, in the last decade plus that a lot of those have been in action. Um, we've gotten some good things out of them, but I don't see the flexibility and the, the um, again, for sort of the price of that compared to this kind of a lander, I don't see the payoff, but you, you, guys, can, you guys can make that call. Hey, yeah. You want to just wrap it up and then we can come back to you during questions? So I will, yeah. Um, EDNA methods, connectivity among databases, uh, and support for data storage. Having video is incredibly large and difficult to store, and it's not subsidized at all. Um, so cyc a cyclical relationship with industry, this is really important. I, the focus at NSF has increasingly become this commercialization, that's a one-way path. That's how can we help industry? That shouldn't be the question. The question should be, how can industry help us? The total budget of NSF is dwarfed by the quarterly profits of some of these large corporations. How can we make this? We can do the basic research that feeds into that, but how can industry help to support these kinds of really expensive programs? Uh, more mid-scale programs to foster larger interdisciplinary groups. We need larger ships with telepresence to bring people from shore out there and lower emissions. Bruce Applegate's looking at uh, using um, hydrogen to power large research vessels. We should be looking at that. 
more NDSF assets and not maybe, yes, a midsize ROV is a good idea, but these kinds of landers and really flexible, cheaper platforms included in those shared facilities, more partnerships we heard about. Um, and I talked about mining and marine CDR. Um, the one thing I want to leave you guys with is this. Uh, this is a plug for education and outreach and bringing this message into the public. This is uh, an augmented reality in the background there is a sculpture um, that if you look at it with your phone, these are the creatures that live on a deep sea coral reef that are illustrations of them from the Smithsonian that are swimming through these corals and give people more of a sense of, there's the marine snow coming down, a sense of what these habitats are like and really bringing that connection to people. And I think um, that emphasis on education outreach is a really, really important one. Um, that, sorry about going over time and uh, I'll turn it over. Thanks, Ajit. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dave. Um, whenever you're ready, Dave. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, oh, we got way to the end here. Um, yeah, I'm Dave Hutchins uh, from the University of uh, Southern California. Um, Ajit asked me to give a little bit of overview of what I think some of the priorities are for phytoplankton research, especially in light of climate change, which we've heard already a lot about and we're all thinking about. So I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna keep it fairly simple, um, but climate change is complex. And we heard that from, for instance, Christie's talk, uh, phytoplankton are affected by ocean acidification. They're affected by hypoxia, by changes in stratification, nutrient supplies. All those things are very important uh, to the primary producers of the oceans. But I would put forward a case that the one overriding problem we have right now is a heat emergency in the world ocean. This is um, the IPCC consensus model here um, showing their prediction for the um, temperature anomaly by the year 2100. Um, and they're showing that uh, the many areas of the ocean will increase by two to as much as four degrees um, by the end of this century. Um, and I think we all uh, agree that's an issue. I think what caught us off guard and uh, kind of on the back foot is last summer, the year 2100 arrived 77 years early. Um, this is uh, the sea surface temperature anomaly for July, 2023. Um, the color scale is a bit different than this graph here, but the magnitude is almost exactly the same. So uh, much of the ocean was 2 to 3.5 degrees hotter than it should have been that time of year. Um, and as uh, I'm sure you know, we've set heat records in the ocean every month since. Um, and I will put forward that we need to be thinking about what the impacts of this are on primary producers in the ocean. Um, there's been, a, rightfully so, a lot of concern from the coral community about the massive tragedy of bleaching, global bleaching that has occurred in the last past year. Um, and there's been a lot of um, interest in trying to understand what the impacts are on fisheries. But I would suggest that we know a lot less about how these uh, heat wave events and the general heating of the ocean is affecting the phytoplankton communities that underpin almost all marine uh, food webs. Um, you can also easily see here, and it, just by a glance, that heat is not uh, evenly distributed in the ocean. Of course, some areas got a lot hotter than others. One of the most intense heat waves happened here in the North Atlantic, which is, um, of course, the uh, um, I'm sorry about that. It is the uh, stronghold of um, the nitrogen fixers. So let's think about what the implications of this summer heat wave 
might have been for those uh, nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria that live there. So this is just some simple heat, uh, I mean, uh, temperature um, uh, response data that we published some years ago for two of the dominant uh, nitrogen fixers in this area, trichodesmium. Um, you can see these curves of across the, the growth rate across a temperature range for trichodesmium, three isolates here, and for four isolates of the unicellular nitrogen fixer, Crocosphera. And so this gives you some, a simple picture of how they might react as temperatures change in the ocean. So let's try to put those in the context of the, um, of the event that happened in the North Atlantic last summer. So if you look at the average temperature of the North Atlantic last summer, it was a couple degrees higher than it should have been. Uh, it's about a little over 25 degrees. Um, and let's see what that means on these these temperature curves of these two uh, nitrogen fixers. For, for trichodesmium, that falls right in the middle of their optimum temperature. They were growing very well through that. And for Crococosphera, they haven't even reached their optimum temperature yet at 25. So they're still on the upward curve. So you might think, hey, there's no problem. Uh, nitrogen fixation should be thriving in the North Atlantic. And that's undoubtedly true in a lot of these warming areas. These two groups are predicted to be favored by some warming. But what that leaves out is that the heat is not evenly distributed. In fact, in some areas of the North Atlantic, it was much hotter than this. This is the temperature that was recorded from that extreme heat wave that occurred on the Southeast uh, US shelf last summer where temperatures went up to 36 or even 38 degrees. And you can see that none of our cultures of, uh, of nitrogen fixers can tolerate that temperature. As a matter of fact, I don't think there's any measurements of it, but I would predict that there was a local extinction event in this region last summer at, at, when this heat wave occurred. Let's go to a different system that uh, is closer to home for me. Here's the California upwelling system. So here's all these upwelling plumes that we get on the um, West Coast here. And of course, they support these very productive communities of large chain forming diatoms that uh, supercharge our food webs out here. So let's think about what increasing temperature is doing to this, um, this uh, ecosystem. Here's an experiment we did um, in which we tried to think about that. So these are the four treatments we used. We took communities from natural communities from this area, and we incubated them at the present day average summer temperature for Southern California uh, coastal waters, 21. And then we did a heat wave treatment where we bumped that up to 25 degrees for a couple of days and cycled it back down. So a temporary heat wave. We also did a future hotter ocean, 26 degree average constant treatment, and then a future heat wave treatment where we cycled it up to 30 degrees for 48 hours and then back down repeatedly. And then we looked at the structure of this uh, phytoplankton community. So let's look at that real quickly here. The dominant diatom genus here in the present day um, mean treatment and the present day heat wave treatment was Leptocylindris. Leptocylindris is one of the dominant diatoms in California today. So I think this is a chain of them here, although it's not quite in focus. So the community didn't change much. When we look in the future mean temperature treatment, we the dominant diatom was Chaetoceros. And here's a Chaetoceros here. That is definitely one of the dominant diatoms that we have in California today. So what this suggests is there is some resiliency built into the system in terms of phytoplankton community structure. Where things got really strange is where we went up to the future heat wave and we increased the temperature only briefly to levels that this ecosystem has never seen before several degrees higher than the highest record temperatures 
What we got here was 70% of the amplicons we recovered were something called arcocellulose mammifer. What is that? Well, I certainly didn't know when we got it because I'd never heard of it. It's not, you're not gonna find it in this community here. It has never been reported from California waters before. It's a tropical diatom that grows in places like aquaculture ponds in the South Pacific. And yet it was 70% of the ASVs that we recovered from uh, this future heat wave. And what this tells us is that unprecedented heat waves are going to lead to unprecedented phytoplankton communities. And this uh, is going to have implications for the food web. These small pennate diatoms, if they take over from these large chain forming centric diatoms, it's going to have ramifications all the way up to the food web to, to fisheries. We also need to think about mechanisms of responses. So this is an experiment uh, we did in Narragansett Bay with the Picocyanobacteria synecococcus. What we did was we took the Narragansett Bay community and we incubated it for two weeks at 18 degrees here and at 30 degrees here. And then we isolated synecococcus cultures using flow cytometry and ran thermal response curves, which you can see here. Interestingly enough, the incubations at these two temperatures sorted the population into two thermotypes. There's cool thermotypes shown here in uh, the dashed blue lines. And there was a warm thermotype that came out in the high temperature. And these have significantly different thermal maximum values you can see over here. And also thermal optimum values were different. So we actually pulled two different heat tolerant populations out of the same population. When we went and sequenced these, we found something we didn't expect. These two thermotypes were 99.9% .9 identical across 99% of the genome. We could hardly find any differences between them uh, genetically. The only difference we could find after a lot of sleuthing was some epigenetic changes in the, uh, um, the photosynthetic pigments. That's the only difference we could find. And yet this really minor difference could have big implications for their ecology. So this curve here shows the, um, the present day distribution of summertime temperatures in Narragansett Bay. And here's the optimum of that cool thermotype. And so this suggests that the, uh, the cool thermotype is gonna have all the advantage, uh, at least in terms of temperature tolerance today. Here is the optimum of that high temperature thermotype. And in the dotted line is the projected uh, distribution of summertime temperatures in the year 2100. And you can see as that, that uh, ecosystem warms up, there's going to be an increasing niche for this warm thermotype where it's going to have the advantage over the cool one. And so this very small microdiversity change in this population where individuals have different epigenetic patterns could translate into uh, the ability of this uh, community to be resilient to the future changes um, in this ecosystem. So I'll, I'll wrap up with some unresolved, what I think are some unresolved questions about uh, phytoplankton in this uh, global ocean heat emergency that we're uh, um, in the middle of. We don't know much about how phytoplankton recover from things like local extinctions following these extreme heating events. Um, I would say we know almost nothing about that. Uh, we can ask at what point do these uh, heat stressed algal assemblages under and reorganization? Um, and is that, are those changes permanent or can, are they reversible? We don't know. We can ask uh, about different, phytoplankton functional groups or major taxonomy, taxonomy uh, level type questions. So you've, it's thought, for instance, that cyanobacteria are more resilient to increasing temperatures than diatoms. But we don't really know that much about the differences between major groups or between species. And then, as I just showed you, I think we need to look a lot farther down in terms of microdiversity. We need to look inside populations 
at the diversity it, it, that exists at the individual level. Because it appears from our syndicate caucus work that this kind of hidden thermal microdiversity could actually provide resiliency uh, for, that it might allow them to persist in a warmer ocean. So my, my recommendation for what I think we should do to deal with these questions is fairly simple. I think we need to get out there and look at what's happening in these major uh, heat wave events. I think we need rapid response studies uh, using our um, infrastructure like uh, research vessels and the time series sites. I think we need to evaluate what these shifts are and what implications they have for the ocean food web. The best way to do this would be to follow the phytoplank assemblages all the way across the processes before to get a baseline before to look at responses during the heat waves. And what I think is most important, you need to stay there and after the heat wave dissipates and follow how these uh, communities are gonna recover afterwards or if they're going to. As we heard from Christie's talk, and I didn't talk about this, but clearly co-stressors are important. We need to think of nutrient limitation, acidification, hypoxia, and so forth, because all those can interact with heat stress. We know that there's a lot of literature on it. And so they need to be considered in these types of studies too, clearly. And finally, as my last slide showed you, I don't think we know at what level of diversity that thermal uh, responses resides. Is it in major functional groups? Is it in uh, species to species differences? Is it in population level micro diversity? Um, it seems that res thermal resilience can sometimes reside um, at, a, at a micro diverse level that you couldn't capture by amplicon sequencing or even metagenomics. And so I think we need to look a lot more deeply into the regulatory strategies of phytoplankton at the transcriptional and translational levels. And probably field work is not enough. We need to isolate some of these uh, important species and bring them back to the lab where we can really do in-depth physiological and molecular characterization that can complement the, um, the study. Uh, uh, that that has needs to be done in the field. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you, Dave. I guess now we can open it up for questions and maybe circle back mm -hmm. to Eric if he had other points to make. But first questions to Sonia. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a general question. So this question is for all of you, but particularly the last couple of you. When you're referring to a lot of these changes, one of the things my mind went to is we also need to be monitoring these things in real time, and then we can calibrate our models and adjust them accordingly. Can any of you speak to the uh, technology and the capabilities of our spectral systems and our satellites right now to be able to distinguish among these different communities. And again, I'm generally familiar with some of my, uh, the, the phytoplankton, but would we be able to detect portions of the microbial food web with some of those technologies in the different spectrum? I mean, I would generally say no. I mean, we, we can do some phytoplankton, and I, I guess in terms of when you're thinking about mixotrophs, you can get a little bit of that from the satellites, but for the heterotrophic capacities for the um, bacterial microbial communities, no, you just really can't do that by satellite. Satellites can give you a little bit of size spectra, which you can in, infer some function for in terms of energy transfer, but yeah, satellites don't do a lot for us at the moment. And this is kind of out of my expertise, but um, they also only give you information about the very surface processes and nothing that's happening underneath. 
I think they make a great complement for phytoplankton to uh, actually getting out there and um, looking into the community, but they're not going to replace um, actually going and uh, doing the science and, and uh, doing things like vertical profiles. But yeah, we can get some information about the phytoplankton, obviously, from their pigments. I think it's a, I think it's a quick comment. I think it's a bit of an open question on uh, with the newer satellite ACE, yeah. but it is extremely difficult to pick up different pigment types because the absorption coefficients are close, so close to each other, and it's masked by the water reflectance in the atmosphere. So it makes it very difficult. So not, not, not that it can't be done, but it's not, it's not easy. It's not easy. Um, so Sonia and Mike both talked about standardization across uh, studies as a as a key recommendation, and I'm wondering if you all could talk a little bit more about the idea and how we could um, formulate recommendations on setting these standards, and um, and also if the standardization effort should or could have backward compatibility for the decades of data that we already have. Well, um, I can just start and uh, then tag team on this one. The When I think about the kinds of omic data that I was talking about, I think there are two real facets to consider. One is intercalibration. We simply don't know how intercomparable or backwards or forwards looking these data types would be right now we're not sure where the largest uncertainty is. Is it happen at sample collection, sample preparation? Does it hap happen at the sequencing facilities and how which instrument you choose and how it's run? Or does it happen, is the larger sensitivity on the back end with the high degree of variability in how everyone chooses to process their data? And uh, really to, to look at those sensitivities across that pathway, we need a concerted effort that's supported to go in and try to look at that intercompatibility and understand where the biggest sensitivity is so that we can address that in terms of thinking about how to link those moving forward. Mike, do you want to take a shot? No, I'm sorry. There, there's not a lot that I can add. I come at it from the perspective of someone who wants to use this data. And so partners with people like Sonia or Dave who generate this kind of data. And I always ask them, hey, can I compare your results to this? the results from this other interesting paper that I saw? And they tell me, no. So I can't give advice. Maybe Dave can add something. Yeah, I think Sonia uh, put it very well. Um, probably the problems arise at all the steps she outlined, right? And so uh, understanding which one is the most problematic or which ones are is important. And it's something that we really haven't addressed. So she put it very well. Maybe. I'll just follow up that um, the community recognizes this is a big challenge and you will have noticed that in fact, there's a grassroots effort to try to do some of this on metatranscriptome data from the eukaryotic groups, which is particularly tricky to work with. But this is a, a grassroots effort led by the, the um, vision of some early career researchers, including Harriet Alexander and Natalie Cohen, and they have funds from OCB for a scoping workshop, but we're limited in our capacity to really spend the money to, to drill down and do that intercomparison effort that I was mentioning and a more sustained focus on doing that kind of work with a program it would be valuable. I wanted to also just mention that I think in terms of allowing other people to use this data and have it be discoverable is a key critical challenge. 
right now, as I mentioned, the data is stored and is accessible and discoverable mm -hmm. in its raw format. So you have to go all the way back to the raw data files coming out of the sequencer and then reanalyze everything, which again, we don't know how that affects your interpretation to be able to really go on and use that data. And so this is a real challenge and we need to think about how maybe looking to examples like NASA with satellite products can version these analytical types and offer portals or frameworks to go in and pull de these derived or partly analyzed data products for others use looking to like Mike, who would say, I want to use this data and I want to compare it, but you don't necessarily want to reanalyze everybody's data. Thanks for that question. Thanks, Sonia. Brian? Hi, thank, thanks for this. I want, I want to kind of think about or ask the question around what expectation we have that we will create enough understanding to allow us to forecast in some meaningful sense the changes in ocean ecology that we might most care about from a societal perspective. So I want to just focus on that that outcome. And that doesn't necessarily mean fisheries, because it can mean any kind of examples of the integrated ocean ecological kind of outcomes. And pull it back to the challenge around, you know, we've Dave Hutchins just showed us, you know, temperature dependent sensitivity, but as noted earlier, pH is changing, oxygen is changing. We know these things are correlated, but the responses aren't always correlated in a simple way. <laughs> so my question is, is there a strategy to kind of weave together the kind of the uh, the way in which the, the organisms respond to build a, a, an understanding that allows some forecasting of the kind of extreme outcomes in the ecological space? So I don't know who wants to kind of solve that tiny little problem. And it's about a strategy for it. I don't, you know, is there a is there a way in which we can tackle that meaningfully, collectively? I guess I can start from the sort of broadest perspective. Um, there have been some modeling studies looking at uh, the change in distributions of fisheries as you said you know that's where noah's invested a lot of effort and um funding and uh there that's coming along they're doing some really great work uh and i think i you know you heard from malin pinsky who's on the forefront of some of that stuff um and that's going well but that it's not mechanistic those those predictive habitat models those uh are all species distribution models are all correlative depending, you know, there's lots of different versions of them. We've moved to sort of an ensemble approach that is really useful that kind of averages out all the biases of those various things, but none of them say, you know, this is the effect of temperature on metabolism, which is going to affect energetics, which is going to mean this isn't going to be able to survive or reproduce or, you know, those kinds of steps in between don't exist. And I think if you took that to, I'm not going to speak for, you know, the biological oceanographers and the, the plankton level, but, you know, that is, uh, I think David was talking about that, that those fisheries species are chasing their food and their food is chasing the productivity, right? So that if you enter all of that stuff, if you're truly doing this at an ecosystem level, you need those mechanistic models to start from the bottom and work their way up. Um, and that's a, it's a huge challenge, but I think, you know, we're, I think we are kind of on the way towards that. And I would add that, I mean, we are starting to do that. I mean, the, the CMIP class models are modeling how the biological carbon pump is responding to no, climate change. No.
Okay. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. Is uh, someone online can give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Yes, you can. Okay, great. Um, we are having some technical difficulties on this side. Uh, the screen went offline. So we're going to take a short break. Uh, I hope we can stick around till we get back. Um, I know Sonia that you're in the middle of your um, um, of uh, of your event, and so if you need to go, that's okay. I mean, thank you again for being here. But we carry on. We carry on. Yeah. Carry on. yeah. yeah. But we can't. It hear, seems right? to be working they... now. From they can the us, we can't hear them because if we unmute ourselves, then we're going to have an echo problem. Unless there's one person on mute. That's right. Okay. So let me just try this. Um, can somebody say something online? Somebody online say something? Hello, Ashley. It's okay. Brad. Yep. Turn your volume way up. Yeah. Turn the speaker on. Okay. Uh, maybe we'll do it this way. Um, the way we were was um, Brad had asked a question, then there was a bunch of people who had their hands up. Uh, um, the next one was Pete. Do you want to go? Yeah, I'm going to unmute. Yeah. Okay, there we go. 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 And third and time's the chime. All right, can everybody hear me online? Not We're, anymore, you muted again. We're not getting anything, yeah, you sound muted. But it also looks like there's a bunch of people in the room that are all unmuted and that's causing a big echo. Uh, Tuba, Rick, Maya, Marcia, Lila are all unmuted. Turn on the mute, and then after he asks, the question, turn it back on so you can hear the people. Again. I don't know because I'm, I'm, I'm pretty Okay. How about now? Okay. 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 So I think we have a plan. <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> All right. So the question um, was I'm going to, I'm going to uh, focus this on, uh, the microbial side of things, but I think it's equally relevant for what Eric and others talked about. And th that is, you know, we, we uh, your presentations really resonated with me, right? We have uh, challenges in understanding patterns and processes across space and time throughout, frankly, like the entire ocean. And there's this tension between, at least in my mind, of really uh, intensely studying uh, a few, uh, sort of a, a subset of locales to really try and make some of the connections that you all alluded to, right? I mean, if you really want to tie processes from the seafloor to the sea surface, there's something to be said for doing that at a specific point in, in space or a number of them. And then there's this question of breadth. And then, you know, that the third question, of course, is all the existing data. And I guess I wanted to ask for those of you thinking about the microbio side of things, I'm going to kind of ask you to, to do something that's difficult and pick one to prioritize. And I want to be clear, this doesn't mean... Doesn't we... mean that... Out loud. Okay. 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 I think you're good. I think you're good. Mike, live now. How about audio? You know, if I turn this on, it's going to be Okay, thank you, Eric. So the question really is this: just, just as a thought experiment, if you if you had to prioritize something for your specific area of research in microbiology and biological oceanography. What would we? What do we want to front load? Is it, is it really thinking about what to do with existing data and data modeling? Do we want to front load site studies, or do we want to front front you know sort of prioritize rather 
uh, to, to look at the global changes. I know it's a difficult question, but I think it's important yeah. if you follow through all of the herpy jerkiness. <laughs> We're getting a lot of noises and comments from multiple venues, but I think I followed that and hopefully you can hear me and, uh, you know, that's like asking to choose a favorite child. So uh, thanks for that question. But uh, I, I personally feel that there is real value in leaning into the time series from my perspective. While we have some omics measurements, for example, from bats or hot across profiles over time on scales that we know are already changing, that's largely been ad hoc with a certain investigator coming in with one of those views. And if we were able to take that multi-omic view across time and the time series in a really concerted way, and maybe if I'm being greedy enough days to do uh, a little bit of process work around that, for example, samples over a day-night cycle, samples, uh, and link those then to these core measurements at the time series with all the rates, the stocks, the things that go into models. I just think that would be transformative in terms of trying to link some of these uh, observations into the more mechanistic and process level work. That would be my vote if I have to pick just one. I agree. Pairing the omics approaches with time series that are already measuring the rates can hopefully allow us to link the omics to function. And it's the function that then goes into the models. And so the and then once we can get that, hopefully estimate function rates from omics then you start to be able to use the omics that's being generated around the world. And I, I would agree that the time series are perfect laboratories for some of the questions we need to address. But I might add a little something to what Sonia said. I think just looking at uh, uh, omics correlations with uh, measured variables is not quite enough. I think you need to also link it to experimentation if you really want to get the mechanistic insights that then are going to hopefully go to make those new generation of models that uh, Mike and, and Eric are talking about that, uh, that are going to actually be based not on correlations, but actually on an understanding of the processes that are going on. Thank you. Uh, Mark? <clears throat> Jimmy, oh, sorry, Jimmy, go ahead. Um, think of your instrument, my computer reset. So, go oh, sorry. Jimmy, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thank you guys so much. Um, so, actually, Pete set that question up um, um, really well because my question was um, thank, thank you guys all for your like thoughtful um, opportunities and strategies. And many of you guys mentioned private partnerships. Um, but many of them were funders like Simons or Gordon and Betty Moore. And um, I guess I wanted to get at, you know, what sort of private orgs could you see partnering specifically to support TIP or just what we just discussed, you know, advancements in capacity building, data standardization, maybe even intercomparison efforts like Sonia mentioned, or what um, you guys all just talked about, about leaning into time series and, and linking multi-omic views. You know, um, what are some creative partnerships that we can, you know, um, specifically highlight um, to, to advance this, this need um, that you guys just highlighted? Thank you. Thanks for that question, Shimi. I This isn't uh, exactly uh, .org type situation like you were looking for, but uh, one thing that comes to mind that I want to point out is that the Department of Energy has made major investments in both thinking about systems context from molecules to 
ecosystems in terms of data analysis infrastructure of building out individual cellular models, which we can use to test the sensitivity and then integrate into the larger scale models. And um, again, the, from the national labs to their institutes to some of their products, there's already been all of this investment. And I think we don't necessarily need to look at that as new investment, although that would be great, but a partnership and linking to some of that infrastructure and resources that have already been developed and to have them help integrate marine thinking and our ocean omics view into some of those systems that are already ready to sort of develop. Um, I could give a different perspective. And thanks for that question, Shimi. Uh, there's a few, when I was talking about, you mentioned TIP, and I was talking about a cyclical relationship with industry and not this sort of one-way thing. Um, you know, I came on a couple minutes early and you guys were talking about the um, telecommunications cables, which I think is a good example of infrastructure that's already sitting there that science hasn't really tapped into. Um, there have been some partnerships with like cruise ships to collect data around the world, yachts, the same kind of thing. Um, one that hasn't been exploited yet is the giant fiber optic network with in place stations that's all over the Gulf of Mexico in the form of oil rigs. These are all over the place. They're all hardwired. They could be collecting insane amounts of data levels relevant for the physical oceanography. Um, you know, these are off of California. You could make as decommissioning proceeds, you could make permanent offshore labs on some of these structures. These are, you know, that's a billions of dollars in investment that's just sitting there untapped. Um, we also, you know, we have our friends from Schmidt Ocean Institute are here, the Ocean Exploration Trust, some of the other, um, you know, Necton Group, some of the other private foundations and the um, a few billionaires running around with large research vessels and submersibles that have access to the deep ocean. And there are a limited number of scientists that have access to that. And um, only a few cases in, that I know of, of partnerships with NSF. Um, and uh, those are often up to the investigator to sort of navigate that funding space and go back and forth between those organizations. And that could greatly be facilitated. Um, Mark, I'm going to go with the order that I have here. This is so easy. Yeah. Um, so a number of you talked about cyber infrastructure, and this is a bit related to the last couple of questions. But um, I'm curious if you could add some more specifics on like where the most pressing needs are. For example. Are there needs in HPC computing? We've heard from some communities that particularly at smaller colleges and universities, these aren't as easily available. Is it more in the data storage, data, you know, the data products on you? We mentioned this a little bit. Is it in workforce training, trying to get knowledge from the computer, computer science community into ocean sciences? I'm just kind of curious where the big holdups are and like where the biggest bang to the bus would be in terms of investment moving forward in cyber infrastructure. I'll just share from my perspective again. Uh, it's hard to pick just one of those, Mark. I see all of them in, in terms of the omics, uh, microbiology, molecule space as critically important. Um, HPC, I mean, these omic analyses, and if we were to integrate this in a meaningful way into the time series, this is a large HPC high memory node for weeks type of effort to try to process these data. And so this kind of, again, ad hoc, everyone tries to find their own little HPC 11 and do their own thing is unlikely to be fruitful in the long term. Similarly, if we want to make derived 
data products from all of that compute investment accessible and discoverable, we need to store it somewhere. That also takes up space. I'm in trouble at the moment because I am taking up more space than most of my institution at the moment. And uh, again, an ad hoc, well, Sonia is going to try to keep this accessible as long as she can type of approach is not the way to do it. And as I mentioned in my remarks, we need to train the next generation of oceanographers to be able to generate, analyze, and discover and use these data products. So I think all three of those facets are current roadblocks that need to be addressed. And um, Yeah, uh, thank you. So bear with me. My question has evolved a bit as people have been answering portions of it through this conversation. And so I'm at a slightly different question now. But you, know, you guys were talking about, a number of you touched on how we recognize humans have a lot of activity occurring in the ocean industry, and we're shifting and promoting <laughs> promoting even more in different aspects, things that we are, um, offshore wind. And at the same time, there are a lot of unanswered questions about the deep ocean as well as the microbial loop. And recognizing that the industry is not waiting for us to answer those questions before they're actually beginning to test and move forward with initiating some of these actions and activities. And so how do we, <clears throat> How do we address the fact that the science is a bit behind the speed at which the industry is moving? How do we leverage the resources that industry is using to answer some of these questions? And one, why don't we do this already? And how do we facilitate that kind of shift and change? And I mean this from a cultural perspective in terms of individual researchers thinking more creatively about um, these partnerships, but also even requiring the regulatory agencies to enforce, maybe even require as part of say like lease offering by BOM that say an offshore wind developer has to partner with and or share the data that collects. They collect a lot of data and it sits in these kind of proprietary repositories that few people ever see. But if you think about let's say an example, of the offshore wind industry in the East Coast, they've collected a ton of data in the, in the New York Bayou. And it's in these patchwork um, proprietary silos from each individual um, developer. So, sorry, it's a long, complicated question, but it's been evolving as we've been discussing. No, that's a, that's a great one. And I can just talk about um, that issue from my experience with the oil and gas industry. Um, it is, you, you know, you kind of answered your own question in a way because it is in the regulatory agencies. So it's that requirement that those environmental impact assessments are done in the first place, which especially for uh, CDR, they are not really in place. And what is required is really incomplete, insufficient, in my opinion, and then requiring that those data are made public. Um, Boehm houses a lot of industry data and you can get access to a lot of it, uh, but you have to navigate that individually. You have to know who to ask. You have to go to their facilities. It's really complicated. Um, it's not really easy. And the industry should be funding the collection of that environmental data. This is part of that cyclical process. These are national resources. These belong to every person in the United States. We shouldn't be just handing them over and allowing the extraction and or taking, you know, profiting from these parts of land that are and seafloor that are part of uh, our, you know, national heritage. Um, so industry should be funding the collection of those data and those data should be public. And that takes a government regulatory agency to put those regulations in place. And that, you know, it goes beyond NSF. Um, that's somebody else, but it needs to be done. And we're way behind. Science is not going to be able to go fast enough with small pieces of funding to catch up with industry. No way. 
Thanks, Eric. And Steve, you've been very patiently waiting. I guess you get to get my last question before we wrap up the session. And then lunch, right? So, uh, so I'm what we want to sort of bring up is that there's trying to put these different elements together, and one element is um, sort of large infrastructure projects collecting data in the global ocean and models that put all that together to try to make predictions of what's happening. And those models have rates of what's happening, including biological ones that that are are used to inform our our forecasts. But on the other side, we've been hearing from, from you all and lots of other people um, that species matter, that the way an ecosystem functions is dependent upon the species that that are in there, whether it's kelp forests or the phytoplankton or or the diatoms. Um, and you've all given examples of that. And so this, my question is, how do we reconcile those two worldviews that one, where you can, you can generate some rate of biological stuff that you can put into a global model, and then two, that you have to know the species that are really there in order to know how that ecosystem functions. And, you know, I'm, I'm just, how, how do you see those elements coming together? Do you need to know every species there in order to predict how the ecosystem functions? How do you, how do you pick which ones are important? How do you, how do you bridge the gap between the species specific world um, that's coming from the genomics and the, um, the sort of modeling, let's try to just estimate stuff world? So Steve, I think I can try to start answering that. And I think that taking sort of a trait-based approach can be a good way to match these. So with the example of Balassia syra, that seems to be really important to carbon export in the California current ecosystem, there has to be some reason that it's important. My personal thought is that it's because there's some evidence that that taxon is digestion resistant. And so when it gets eaten by zooplankton, it's passing right through the guts and contributing directly to export without being consumed by the grazers. So if that's, I think we need to make those links. Is it digestion resistant? Then we look at what other taxa are digestion resistant and how does the digestion resistant trait vary in time and space rather than necessarily how do each of those species vary in time and space? And so that may become a mechanistic link that we can make. We can predict when digestion resistance will, will be prevalent, and then we can predict what the impact of that will be. And I think we can do that with a lot of different traits in the ocean, but it comes like there's a link in there where we have to understand how these traits are varying in time and space. And that comes initially from some investigations of these species. It may be looking at the species that tells us something's going on, and then we figure out the important traits. Christy Croker had a similar point in her recorded um, talk where she was talking about looking at species that have a, a strong impact on the environment, so sort of the strong interactors, um, and trying to find those and, and use those. But that's an ecological question and is, is going to require some very careful look at a lot of different ecosystems. Um, yeah. I think in my, from my point of view, NSF is doing a pretty good job of that, Steve. I mean, they funded, uh, for years, they funded dimensions of biodiversity. Now there's this new biodiversity RFP that just came out with bio and geo together. Um, actually, I think NSF recognizes that issue very well. And, and hopefully, if we get enough uh, uh, good investigators working on it, we can, we can actually answer some of the questions you're raising there. Right, and make that link between that complicated data and then the, the, the modeling efforts that, that, that can't deal with thousands of species all, all everywhere. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Um, just want to say that uh, Carlos has a question in the chat, um, but um, since we are basically now 10 minutes behind, uh, I would like to point you to the question and then see if you have answers. And this has to do with other ways of collecting uh, data using uh, basically working with fishers, small scale fishers. Maybe you want to ask the question then we wrap. Okay, yeah, maybe, maybe I can just ask it for a future thought. I, I, I was just wondering, based on the questions mostly by Shimi and Percy, 
uh, about networking, getting information that be key to answer some of these questions. And I'm always thinking about ways to collaborate with you know local economic knowledge holders and fishermen, small scale, etc. So I was just wondering that, right? Uh, what are some things that if there is anything that could be observable by fishermen and their vast fleets in different places that are always out there that could shed light or maybe uh, raise an alarm, maybe a shift in a key indicator species that links the microbial loop with the larger species that are the focus of fisheries, anything like that, you know, uh, that could provide a partnership with fishermen across the world and they could share maybe by social media, things like that. Maybe. I don't know, just, yeah, brainstorming. Thanks, Carlos. Um, I would like to thank the speakers um, for putting the time and and with that, I guess we call the session close. Correct. And I guess that, that concludes our open public session for the day. Um, so thank you to those of you who were online um, observing from the public. Very much appreciate you all's presence here. And I hope you got as much out of these two sessions as we did. I certainly furiously wrote down notes. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you. And with that, I guess we're breaking for lunch. Yeah. Yes.